Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, this is Killing for Company. My name is Kellen, and today is the first um, episode in a series dedicated to Blue Owl Snord. So I've got two people here with me. Um, we got Peter from the Metal Vault and Jeff from Metal Madness 66. And today we're going to be going through um, the Blue Owl Snord catalog starting in 95 with Ultima Thule and moving all the way through uh dialogue with the stars uh memoria of Tustra part two and from 2009 so um thank you everyone for coming on by and checking us out uh i'll just kind of check in for here first with peter and jeff um we've got a lot to cover here today so uh we're yeah, just gonna yeah. get moving um and do a brief introduction on the band and then from there um we'll jump into the uh, the records. So uh, Blue House Nord primarily is um, a run by an artist who was by Vince Fall, and uh, from Normandy in France. Uh, the project officially started in '95, and from there um, there were two. Demos prior in 93 and 94, which uh, Vince Falls released under the name Vlad. And uh, there are some other projects that we'll kind of get into later, but um, I guess I'll jumping straight into the catalog for Blue House Nord. Um, I'm just going to start and open it up here to our guest. So, Peter. Um, when was the first time you heard Blue Owl Snored? And, um, you know, what was your initial impression and what's been your sort of experience with the band since then? Okay, I probably jumped in with the band with The Mystical Beast of Rebellion. Um, so it was about 2001. Um, that came out on Oaken Shield. And at the time, Open Shield was uh, releasing a few bands um, from brands like Net and Hema, um, Temple of Baal, that kind of thing, sort of black metal. And um, I used to buy a lot of um, albums from Supernal Distro in England. Um, and that was recommended um, by the guy who used to run it, a guy called Alex. So he used to send out a newsletter. So I think I picked it up from there. So. Yeah, it was 2001. I had heard of the name before. I had seen it, the name in catalogs and distros. Um, but not, it was, those first two albums, for me, were very difficult to find back then. But it was um, a, but it was a uh, blind buy, pretty much? Just recommended blind buy? Well, yeah, I mean, Oak and Shield, more or less. I've seen Oak and Shield. So they were, I'm not sure if they're still going, but they were sub-label, sub-label of uh, Adam Hussier from France. Who I was very familiar with. Okay. Um, so yeah, first impressions. Right, so long ago now, but mm-hmm. yeah, <laughs> I did enjoy it. It felt very. It, it wasn't like the style at the time because you remember the late nineties. You had the Swedish sort of fast paced black metal. The Norwegians were going off from Tamsins, and then you had a lot of the symphonic stuff, the Cradle of Filth. And, Demi Bourgier. Yeah, brought, yeah. Brought through, so um, it was raw. It was, it was um, you know, an industrial tinge back then. It wasn't fully developed in that album, but uh, very kind of distant riffs. Um, I did enjoy it, um, but for me, I think it's the follow-up album, the work that transforms God, or which transforms God, yeah. was a real eye for me and that's like this band is something special yep and then as we move through there and then you hit albums like Mort then I was like what am I getting myself into here <laughs> <laughs> I think around that time for me um, my tastes were all over the place I was still in the death metal not as much but it was a lot of pagan black metal a lot of fighting stuff folk stuff um most of the old guard of black metal, had, like like I said, had changed. So I'm kind of thinking this industrial stuff mightn't be for me. So 
but I did pick up a few of the other albums after that, you know, Odinist. Um, but for me then, I had a bit of a lull with the band. So when Jeff New first mentioned about doing this deep dive to me, I, I did mm -hmm. say to you, there, I have a big gap in my collection. And it's around the 777 trilogy. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. But for me personally, in my, in my own life, um, my daughter was born in 2010. Yeah, a lot and, going on. Okay. Yeah. And we were moving so, house. So we had, well, we had moved out of our house and we were sure. still, we had for that, we were trying to save up to buy another house. So my uh, purchasing days sort of died off around that time. Yeah. So, your your head was, your head was in home ownership <laughs> and young children at that point. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it was there. Bad albums was a, a luxury back then. So, right. Um, but yeah, then I sort of came back around with, uh, I suppose the third part of Memoria Fistusta. 2014. Uh, 2014, yeah. yeah. So, Saturnian, yeah. So, I, I a wee bit of catching up. I know if we, we do the second part, um, yeah. 777 trilogy. So, I do have the last album of that one, but I don't have the first two. So, something I need to rectify. Yeah, you'll have time. Yeah, you know what? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. There's enough. There's enough here in one episode of a deep dive to kind of get wrapped up in. So it's kind of why I thought it'd be good for us to sort of cut it off at some point. And um, I think stylistically, it's a dramatic shift. Also, um, what happens once he moves to Deborah Marti? So Jeff, you're up next hey. here. Um, um. Yeah. Okay. So my I told you the story, Kelly. You're going to hear it again a little bit. Um, okay. It was out. Part was out at the local uh i want to say this was 20 and it was either 2013 or 14 i cannot remember which um was out at the local mall record store which quite frankly for quite a long while was the only record store around here which was pathetically sad um but uh, there are a few that have cropped up since then but uh anyways you know, when you go into the mall, you're not really expecting a whole lot, especially in a store like that that was, you know, starting to be overrun by swag and T-shirts and Funko Pop. And, and this is before this is before vinyl started to go ape shit again. But there was a little vinyl that was starting to creep in. So there was, you know what I mean? It was, it was, but it, it was a fucking terrible mall store with a lot of crappy shit in the metal, metal section for the most part. And I went in, I looked, I couldn't find anything. And as I was walking out, I saw a Duke Ellington box set, a three CD box set. And as you guys know, I'm kind of the box set whore. And it's hard for me to walk by a box set that I don't like, especially if it's something cool like that, where, which is, I love big band music. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to grab that. And when I lifted it up behind it was Desanctification and Cosmosophy from the 777 Trilogy. I knew the name. I saw the name and I knew the name and I looked it up on whatever rate your music, I think was the site I was using and they got good marks and they were four bucks a piece. How could you go wrong? Right. So come home. I think I might've popped desanctification in the car as I was driving home. I was like, Oh, I don't know about this. Took it out, put it in the stack to be listened to somewhere down the road and months went by because that's how the stack would grow and, I'd get, you know, turned on to one or two things and they'd be my go-tos for a while. Finally ended up putting Cosmosophy on and was like, holy fucking shit. Wow. Okay, now we're talking. Went back to Desanct and I liked that a little less, but I still liked it. I still enjoyed it. There was something there. And I was like, okay, I got to start looking into this band a little bit. And you know how that goes. You jump on YouTube or you jump on Spotify or whatever I was using at the time. And little by little, I just started grabbing other other albums. I want to say that I probably grabbed Ultima Thule and Fathers of the Icy Age before MV. I'm just going to go MV. I, I have trouble saying that. Memoria Ventusta. MV1 and MV2. I bought that all one time because I got a box set. I got the uh, candlelight years. Um, but I was kind of unlike you, Peter. I had come in in that middle section of material with the 777 area. And that's what I, although I had read that there was industrial leanings and industrial moments and whatnot, that I didn't hear enough of that on those albums to turn me off because I like it. I love Skinny Puppy. I love 
frontline assembly and ministry and stuff like that. So it didn't turn me off. But yeah, for me, um, again, when I put, and Cosmosophy is still my favorite album, although Dialogue is very damn close, Saturnian is very close, Loose and I mean, there's so many good albums. Um, but for me, Cosmosophy, there's just something about that album. The, the sound, the production, the epicness of it without it having, you know, and it, it's black metal, but it's not really black metal. It's it's kind of blue dust nord and that's the thing we were talking about kellen when i first came on is that i kind of look at vinsval as kind of doing three sort of definitive types of albums there's the full-on black metal annihilation nihilist sameness i will say of something like mystical beasts then there's the progressive almost almost prog rocky cosmosophy and uh uh saturnian poetry and then you got the stuff in between that i think is really where he kind of created his really his unique sound and that is that distorted scary otherworldly stuff like the new one for example um which is just oppressively frightening i think um and work to transform god has that real it's where I think he really nailed the synthesis of what his sound was going to be like. You know, that's, that's my opinion of it. But for me, there's kind of three distinct sort of phases that he goes through. And sometimes he does, he'll join one and two phase and one and three phase and three and two phase and make something that's experimental, but it's, he doesn't, for my money, he hasn't really put out the same album over and over and over again. It, so it's it's interesting that you mentioned phases because mm -hmm. I know the interviews with Finn's file are, are quite scarce. Um, but I was able to track down some I went through I actually went through my terrorizer magazine collection today. <laughs> well two hundred and eighty something of them, but um looking for interviews for, for that period from that that we're covering now. And there's absolutely nothing up till the work which transforms God. And then mm -hmm. it's it's in their end of year list. I think it was number four or five from from back then. Wow. But he, but they interview him. Um I actually brought one in here. And in, in this edition, which was January two thousand and seven. And there's actually a two usually it's a small interview session, but that's actually got two pages. And he oh, actually wow. said he doesn't for, as far as he's concerned, his music isn't in phases at all. And uses that word, he says it's not a phase. For him, wow. it's really evolving. And for him, that's what it's all about. And he says, black metal for him is not a musical style, it's a feeling. So if, as far as he's concerned, black metal straight out at all. Even though he does say, I know, maybe jumping ahead of ourselves, but Mort is not a metal album. So. Oh no, not at all. Yeah. And and I see that like where he would call it an evolution as opposed to a phase. I think as fans we hear it more as, or at least I do, I hear it more yeah. as a, a phase. Like this material is kind of like that material, is, but it's not like that material at all. But I can see what he's saying that he his whole process is one continuum. You know. Yeah. So I'll just jump in here quick um, and add my little piece. For me, it was, uh, I mean, I would have been so 19 in 2003. Um, and it's primarily, I, I wonder, Peter, you know, coming from the States, having an introduction, I think, to Candlelight um, Records and what that did for his visibility as a band, as an artist. Um, cause that, that's where I jumped in and I was at the time just kind of getting into black metal. So, um, you know, someone asks you to pick up, you know, dissection or emperor or mayhem or whatever. And then you, you're looking at newer releases that have just come out and you listen to blue house Nord, the work which transforms got it's just like completely, you know, something alien to you. Yeah. Um, 
And I, in the same time, it was captivating. Um, I did, don't think at the time, I outside of an emotional impact that it had on me, I wasn't sonically sort of educated enough to, to notice where all the influences were being pulled from. I just knew like, if this is a, a new black metal band that I need to pay attention to, and one that um, doesn't sound like anything else that I've heard. And just from there, uh, I started to follow the career. And um, I think it's, you know, it's, it's very interesting because to your point, the next record after that is more. And when you said like, what have I got myself into? Like, I definitely had that kind of like, okay, like I, I've, we've taken a turn. Um, so, sure. uh, but from then on, you know, I, I kind of kept track um, because while still being an important sort of an influential, impactful um, band that sort of fell under black metal, I think um, because the sound continued to sort of evolve and strains from the previous record be introduced into a new context on the subsequent record that would follow, um, it was sort of a very interesting, and that comes kind of full circle at the end of this episode for me. Um, but, uh, let's just kind of get into, um, this first record. So 1995, um, uh, Ultima Thule or Lee, uh, was released on Impure Creation Records. Um, and <laughs> we don't know if the, uh, WD Fell is a real person or if that is a <laughs> fictional character that has been created. Um, it's not like uh, the, the drummer and keyboard is out there giving tons of interviews to uh, confirm his identity or existence. So, But yeah, we've never really seen them. And as far as I know, and I could be wrong about this, but I don't think I am. I do not think that Blue has ever played live, correct? Correct. Okay, that's what I, I thought. Do you want to you confirm that, Peter? So, well, uh, from interviews, he, he says he, 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 he wouldn't play live. He doesn't think it's the right setting. He thinks right. that he's very into um, he, he's very into his, his music composition and you know the list of composers he he rhymes off. You know that he is influenced by you know, avant garde classical sort of twentieth century French and Hungarian composers, and he's all about the, the it's all for him. It's all about the art of constructing this soundscape or whatever these these songs loosely yeah i don't uh, know i i kind of envision sort of a ruins of beberas sort of vibe with if he did put a live thing together you know what i mean like but otherwise i feel like a lot of the nuance of course they could do it they could uh, get a second or third guitar player they could add a keyboard to sit live and a live drummer and they could do it but it's so layered it's so thick with atmosphere and everything i don't know how it would translate live. I really don't. Um, so I was pretty sure he hadn't played live, but we don't really know, you know, allegedly FW Felds or whatever is still there twiddling knobs and, you know, doing drum programming and or whatever playing live drums. But you don't hear those live drums early on, man. I mean, those first couple of albums, you do not hear live drums. So I, you know, there's maybe the guy, like you said, Kellen is, his buddy, his nerdy fucking computer buddy that knows how to program drums, you know, <laughs> drum programs. But uh, who knows, you know? Um, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted no, to add that the, point. Oh, you, we got the spotlight here. So do you want to yeah. um, talk about sure. your impression with the record or what sure. you think about it? Yeah. Um, you know, when I heard this album, it would have been five years ago, maybe 2015 is when I got that box set, 2016. And I liked it, but I had already read quite a bit about, I'd already gone and read some reviews of it, you know, dug back through Rate Your Music and found some old, uh, you know, online interviews, or not interviews, uh, reviews. And, um, you know, keep one thing in mind, you guys are in your early 40s, right? I know, Kellen, you're in your 30s. Yeah. Yeah, you're a little younger than both. Peter, you're 40, what, four? 44, yeah. 44, okay. So... You know, and I hate to be that guy who always says, oh, I'm the old man. But in this case, I'm the old man. And so the truth of the matter is that 
I had to come backtracking in through the back door, so to speak, with death metal. You know, I didn't, I knew about stuff like Cannibal Corpse. I knew about Deicide. I knew about the Florida death metal. Didn't know a lot about black metal and, you know, first wave, second wave and death metal over across the seas. I knew a little bit, but not a lot. And so when I, you know, got that introduction with Opeth, you know, I wanted to find other bands were like Opeth. Okay, well, I'm going to love other bands like Opeth. And Bluth was, was, you know, and that was 2001. But it took me a long time to get around to them, even though I knew the, the name. And a lot of that was because, for me, black metal is not my favorite genre. I, I like that old school death metal, man. I just love that knuckle dragon, cavemen, you know, fucking brutal death. Uh, except for I don't like Cannibal Course. Fig figure that one out. Anyway, um, so for me, black metal has to be kind of special or unique. Because I'm not going to lie to you, man. Guys, there's nothing for me more pointless than trying to listen to two cans and a string recording on a fucking a beat a boom box in 1997 in some you know helvetta basement somewhere and being cult i just don't get that i never will get that it's fucking dumb to me sorry that's me that's not you guys i'm not shitting on you if you like that stuff so for me when i put this on i wasn't sure what to expect because I'd already remember heard Cosmosophy and I had a high bar to be set. What I heard right out of the gate pretty much to me was a lot of Bathory worship. Um, it's there. It may not be overt, but at times it is, but at other times it isn't. What I think really sets Ultimate Thule apart and, and lets it stand on its own two legs is the the quality of of um, composition is pretty elevated for for me for black metal of that era because let's let's see we're talking ninety five that comes out what was pure holocaust ninety three yeah and the ninety right so you're looking at you know mayhem was right around then too you're looking at all yeah. the the biggies dropped their albums a few years before. Or in and around that time, or they were putting out seminal albums like, you know, like Pure Holocaust or, um, you know, Mayhem's De Mysterious or something. But what I what I liked about this album is that the, there's a bit of nerdery going on. And the nerdery is in that the compositions aren't just these nonstop blast beats with there's a lot of complex guitar work on this album. It is not simplistic guitar chords. It's not grindy chainsaw stuff, although it has a bit of a different sound than he will later come to. It's a little bit more ferociously in your face guitar sound wise. The drum machine, you know, it's a drum machine and I hate drum machines, but it's not, it's done fairly tastefully. The keyboards are epic and they sound pretty kick-ass the recording and piecing them together sometimes falls a little short, you know, every now and again, there'll be that galloping riff of that. And then suddenly it'll just kind of die off and you'll have this pretty bit of synthesizer come in that sounds all epic. And then it'll start right up. And, you know, you, he was learning his craft at that point. Um, but I really like the album, if you will, Kel, let me just jump to my notes real fast. So what I got on here is thick and pummeling atmosphere with walls of guitar. And oddly, the drum machine on this one doesn't bother me as much as it does on other, other, others of his albums. This one, it sounds better throughout. My, win, my one big detractor about this album is the vocals. They are further out front than usual. And frankly, they sound a bit like childish shrieks that are kind of endearing, yet also very cheesy. Um, but they fit. The mellow moments like, um, let's see, in, crap, I didn't spell that right. Cor you have the uh, album handy there? Yes. What's the first track? Slaughter Day? The, uh, the, the Son the of sun. Horror Frost. Yeah. Oh, what is it? The Son of Horror Frost. Okay, that one right there. Son of Horror Frost. Um, there's really quite ear-catching melodies going on there with the... Uh, with the, the keyboards, I think they actually, recording is a bit amateurish, 
seeing as how some digital studios were pretty rudimentary at that time. And I don't think, I think he did this all at home. I highly doubt he did this in a studio. I could be wrong, but I don't think he did. Uh, the synth are, parts are pretty epic throughout considering the limitations of the equipment and the album comes off epic and great for the genre in time. The Plains of Ida has a big epic batch of chords that morph into a uh, really cool droning synth fade in. And then it fades back in with killer riffs and background swirling sounds and howling shadows writhing. Last Journey to Ringhorn is a cool track. Uh, Till B... What's that one called? Perceive. Bifrost. Till Bi Bifrost? Yeah. Something Bifrost? Uh, yeah, Till I Perceive has, Bifrost. Yeah, has a neat little classical intro. I, I spelled them out, but I spelled them bad and it uh, <laughs> autocorrect changed them to other name <laughs> words. A uh, little classical intro at the beginning, but it's a cool last song. I like this album a lot. Glad he didn't stay totally attached to this specific sound overall because I do feel it's a little one-dimensional. I think this album suffers a bit from a level of sameness, which isn't overt, but I hear a little bit of it. Some similar chord ch changes, key changes, but this is a solid ten out of a seven out of ten for me. So yeah, it's a it's a pleasant it's a pleasurable album. Better than I expected it to be. I expected it to not be very good. And it was far better than I expected it to be. Um, again, probably my big, you know, and this may not bother you two guys because you're much more seasoned black metal veterans. But, you know, my black metal vocals, I really am not a fan of. <laughs> it's like. That's what he sounds like on some of those songs. I'm like, dude, all right, that's cheese. Thankfully, what he did, what he did on future albums, and you guys will probably agree with me, is he started to bury the vocals deeper in the mix, and they were they became a part of the fabric of the songs, and they got a little nastier and got a little scarier and a little bit more menacing. But I think his first attempt at black metal vocals, it's hit and miss for me. Okay. Well, what about you, Peter? Any thoughts or what are your, you know, interpretations of this record? Yeah. Well, for me, I, I suppose I first heard this probably about 2002, 2003. So after I got Misty Old Beast, obviously I was trying to find out their, their um, back catalog and go through them. And I suppose going over, listening to over the last week, to get ready for this uh, show. Um, I think my, 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 my few points changed a wee bit. This mm -hmm. used to be kind of like lower down in my estimation, but I think it's probably one of my favourite, Blue Dice North. And no, it's good. I know I have no a, I've been into black metal for, I suppose, about 93, 93 probably was my first exposure to it, really. Um, if you don't count Bathory. But there is, I, I have funny some notes here, Jeff, too, and I have Bathory written down, too. There is that Bathory influence. Oh, you can't, but, you can't miss the Bathory in the first two tracks. It's, like, right there in your face. Yeah. I mean, I'm, it's I'm, not, I'm, and it's not as epic as, like, One Road to, Road to Asa Bay, where, you know, the horses, and, I mean, that was fucking epic. But this oh, yeah. is, this is getting there. You can tell he wants to go there, but he doesn't want to copy it, you know? Well, he has the, the, my prayer beyond uh, Gunnan Gagar. You know, that there, right. the hymnal choral sort of Viking oh, yeah. chants. Um, yeah. You know, that there is it's just so epic. But for me, this is what I always thought about, struggle with. This guy's probably like 15, 16, and he wrote this album. That blows my and, mind. Yeah. And he's from France, and it's all about Norse mythology. I mean, the Thule, or Thule, Ultima Thule, the farthermost Thule. Farthest region, the, the, right? The farthest. Yeah, that the Greeks and Romans wrote about. Um, and then, you know, so it's worth on to me. He's from Normandy. So maybe he has that interest since. Ah, yeah, I didn't think of you know, that. Uh, due to the Normans. But it's just the whole, con I know it's not a concept album, but for me, it's like a concept. It's oh, this it is. journey. This journey setting out to the this region where the Greeks talked about, I think the three elements were almost one. So you had the air was icy thick, the sea was frozen, um, and there's snow covered everywhere. And then over time it's changed from, they originally thought it was like the, the north of Britain, so it was the Orkney Islands, and then the, 
they said it was Iceland, Greenland, and then Norway, and and even the cover. I used to think the cover is quite nondescript, but the cover is actually you know you got the Viking ship sailing in. There's a choppy yeah. water. And then look at the sky. Now, what's, which pressing is that, Peter? Which pressing is that? The original? Yeah, this is the original okay. and pure creation. See, I have I have the uh, the box set which has a copy in it, but then I also have the singular, the one that was then reissued by uh, Candlelight. They reissued. It's got like a yellow cover. Is that it? Yeah, that that might be it. Yeah, not as cool as the first one. I hate to say. Now, actually, you know, Callum, that's not even it, because that's oh. pretty cool looking. The one I have just looks like a bunch of cascading yellowish ice. It's got it's really not a very good cover. It's super yeah. cheap. Yeah. Um, Sorry about that. Sorry. I, 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 I think the, the the cover, you know, well in the original one anyway, it's it's a perfect match for, for the, oh, yeah. the theme and the the music. I mean what I picked up from it well, I suppose that, I I I took on a wee question here. Who else apart from Varg? was making this type of music at that time because back not like many. I, didn't come to, I, I didn't come to them later on like i said but back then i was buying up all the norwegian stuff straight away so i was getting all those like first emperor you know and then i said clips mayhem right. i bought mayhem the week it came out and double give for a final they yeah, dark throne, you know you're talking dark throne yeah, with their lo-fi yeah. shit you're talking um fucking you know enslaved with full moon mysticism and pure holocaust i mean those are yeah. landmark albums but you're right nobody was really doing anything quite like this yeah. i will say i will say i'm thankful i'm thankful though that when i make fun of vinsval's voice and vocals on this thank goodness it's not like vargs though because vargs was just ass i cannot listen to his stuff it's so it's, silly. I, I, I'm, I'm the opposite see <laughs> <laughs> that those tortured squeals, they they're demented. They're I don't know, they invoke this feeling with this fear that like even the images far used, I know we're gonna talk about Bard, yeah, but it's true. his album covers the, those creatures that were going into those old huts in, in the fjords and stuff. I was thinking that's a horrible, lonely life that they're living and God mm -hmm. knows what's happening to their minds, stuck up in the cold, icy mountains. But um for for this I you know I the vocals are kind of reminiscent of far um the whole oh, ambient man. parts that he brings in quite a, and and for a while i always i did think the album was kind of just one dimensional but i think it's there's so much going on on, on it um because the follow-up for years is probably my favorite of the two but i think this is this deep types kind of make me reevaluate that i mean e even listening to the plane of Ida for me yeah. with, when the bass line comes in, it's, it's it reminds me of the Cure. The Cure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, man, I hadn't cure. thought of that, but you might be right a little bit. Yeah. It's that, that slippery, thing. that slippery sounding bass line that the Cure always something has. Something from Faithless or something like that. Simon you know, Simon Gallup has that slippery, slidey sort yeah. of sound. Yeah. Well, you know, I heard a lot of people talk about, and I I think I can kind of see it that, um. Vinsval writes um, My Bloody Valentine like and you guys are familiar with that My Bloody Valentine right okay writes My Bloody Valentine like black metal now I don't know if I fully agree with that but there's an element of that of truth in there that you know he's got that sort of wash of sound I don't think it's as apparent on this album and the next one I think it becomes a lot more apparent on the work that transforms yeah um and further into the more modern day albums or mid-period albums but but yeah that's interesting i'll have to go back and list that track and hear because cure is one of my favorite bands yeah i didn't hear me, that. me too um and i i just love the the, the, the last journey of of ringhorn um oh great I mean, songs. Such, a, such a great closure and and i mean it's like uh the clean for, again for me i get i i do get this 80s sort of cough meets Bathory, meets Burzum mix. On yeah, that song. I can hear that, yeah. Um, and actually, that la you're talking about the last song? Yeah, yeah. The closure. I actually thought I actually thought that was really kind of like a mega prog song. There's a lot of prog nerdiness going on in yeah. that. Um, but, it's, but it's still vicious, you know. Um, and what's interesting too is, and it's not just this album, but it goes on for a while, 
WD Feld is not credited anywhere. <laughs> oh, right. So I mean, he just he just says that there's the. Um, I think there's a. Let me check the notes. Ogat is a guest bass player, and hmm. that's it. So back then, WD Feld didn't exist. Or if he did, he was still a figment of Vinsval's imagination or something <laughs> at that point, because. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I mean, it, what I read was he used studio musicians, but you know, I mean, I think he clearly did a lot of the of the clearly did a lot of it himself. He had to have. And if you guys are right, if he's really 15, 16, that's kind of insane. You know, yeah. sweet. Um, so my impression with this record, um, uh, I, and so I'm actually relatively new to it. For some reason, I, I think every time I heard it, it just sounded too much like other black metal that I had heard. Um, and I guess I wasn't looking for that from Blue House Nord. So in the interviews that I have come across, Vince Vault has been very open about how much of an influence Bathory had on him. And the way he kind of has framed it, um, is how much of an influence the band had period on so many young musicians who were playing black metal in the early nineties. Oh God. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, it, it is very much like a young musician, like so many of second wave black metal bands um, were influenced by the first in particular, um, a lot that Bathory had sort of the formative work that Bathory had done. And, um, all of that is over this record. Uh, there's really two points. I think why it took me so long to get here is Blue House Nord for me is a weird band in the sense that they bridge a lot of the waves generationally. Um, so being from coming out with a you know, demos in 93, a full length in 95, yet I still in 2022 is still releasing incredibly important material. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting lifespan as a band. And so probably for me going back and, you know, looking at a record from 95 that I thought sounded like a lot of their black metal, at least upon first impression, um, I, I guess I took me a long time to get there. So listening to it over the past, you know, few weeks getting ready for this, I would first agree, um, Plain of Ida is the first time on this record where I really stop in terms of it just grabbed me um, and, and forced my attention. I, that record, that song um, is amazing. And uh, the other part to it that I, I really loved, the track that I think you talked about, Peter, was um, the uh, My Prayer Beyond, I want to see if get this right. Ginu Gap, Gap, is that correct? Um, yeah. If I, it's part of the Norse mythology that explains um, cosmogony or I think that's right. Yeah. So it's an interest in the cosmos through a Norse exploration. So that's an interesting thematic, I think, beginning or start, right? If we talk about the rest of Blue House's Nor, you know, their work and it all being tied together because I, the cosmos um, is going to be a key part to the identity of this band. I think it makes up thematically so much of its work. The fact that he's potentially a teenager, 15 years old has already identified that as being central to the identity of the band and has held that together um, over the, you know, what three decades 
almost pretty close to it. Yeah. Yeah. Coming up um, on it. I think that just, it, I can't believe at that age to have that kind of foresight. Um, I'm completely yeah. amazed that, you know, cause you would think like in some ways bands, you know, evolve over time, but they kind of discard, you know, some part of their identity along the way. Well, um, I mean, you, you could kind of draw a parallel a little bit with Isan with, with Emperor. I mean, he wrote a, predominant portion of in, in the night side eclipse when he was 15 years old which still blows my fucking mind apart you know um get guys like the death angel, angel guys writing the ultra violence at 14 13 you know it just doesn't seem like it should be able to happen and when it does like you're saying he's coming at this from a pretty heady intellectual standpoint Right. You know, when I was 15 years old, I was worried about getting laid and trying to trying to get laid and trying to pick up girls and trying to drink beers and stuff. I wasn't I was in rat mode, dude. You know, I was not thinking about the cosmosophy of the, you know, the stars and, you know. Right. Uh, but I mean, it's just because you, he could have chosen Norse mythology and gone the sort of pagan part of Bathory's route. Right. Like right. all of that, he could have gone that way, which so many bands have done. Right, that's a well fleshed out part oh, yeah. of metal's history. Right. The reason that the, I think is interesting is he was able to latch onto a different part of the mythology and then you know further explore it in a way that I think is unique. Um, he went more esoteric. You know, it's just it's just a different, a different side of of a, of a history. Um, and I think in, in, in to, we'll kind of go through this over the albums, but he's very much when he's been approached in terms of, you know, here you are in France latching on to a sort of, you know, North mythology kind of deal. Um, what's the, the story there? Like, are you, how much is national heritage a part of you? Like, he's always been very open about I don't want this. This my music is not about earthly. It's not tied to sort of like you know, national sort of identity, romanticism. I am very much interested in this other sort of like exploration of the cosmos kind of spiritual identity. Um, yeah. So and he just, that's just his personality and where he goes with his music. But uh, I thought it, that was just an interesting thing that at such a young age, he's been able to sort of identify where the direction of his music would that go. That is crazy. That's crazy. Um, well, but, I, I put yeah. quote from him from back then and, he said, "Blue Eyes Nord is like the sound of the universe." It's like the what? The sound of the universe. Ah, sound of the universe, and it could be that way. I mean, there are some albums that sound like that to me, you know. Um, so you know, all in all, like you know, I, as I said, I'd probably give that a ultimate freeway probably a seven out of ten. Um, and that's probably being a little generous only because I like some of the melodies on it. But I mean, again, if, if it, where, where would you guys stand on that? You think? I don't know. Peter, do you want to go? Well, I, I never sort of, when I was listening to these albums, I wasn't sitting out to try and get my, a score or a rank. Right. Um, I, from listening to them in chronological order, I have come up with, <laughs> A theory of what is going on. <laughs> okay. And since okay. Finn's file's not going to offer up, because he, mm. he has said in, in, I think it was in that two, two page interview from that Terrorizer edition, he says he's not going to explain. He's up, it's, for him, it's up to the listener to come to their own conclusions. So for me, I have this theory around it all. So um, I may as well tell you about it now. So he's starting off with, He's trying to discover Thule, Thule or whatever. So he's setting out in this journey. And when he arrives there, the next album is then him trying to reconnect with his ancestors. Because he, he keeps, because that's the first time we get lyrics, is the second album. And there's a lot of st stuff about the ancient peoples. And he's trying to, to avenge them or whatever, bring revenge. But I think he then, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but this just, he, he stumbles across something that he wasn't expecting, which is the mystical beast of rebellion. And this takes him into a realm that he wasn't expecting. And it's, 
he's there for a while and it transforms him and he starts to come out the other side through the Odinist where he starts to understand what's happening and he has a different perception of his whole existence. Okay, because okay. what's interesting is before you came on, Jeff and I were talking and I was, I the way I was going to approach this was to try and create a graph where it we sort of see sort of how he oscillates between different sort of sounds, whatever. But you have a uh, choose your own adventure loot out yeah, story. You're you have the apparently you have the uh, apparently you have the RPG of uh, Blue Dots North. <laughs> I can see where you're coming from though, because Mort is death, so maybe there's some level of an experience of death there, and then a reborn. You're reborn with the dialogue of the stars, where you become one with the cosmos. So it may be something you know, like you said, who knows? You know, it'd be. I have a I have a feeling that if I sat down with this guy, I would just probably be way too dumb to converse with him on one-on-one -on -one, you know i mean he'd be like bro you're <laughs> go back to your go back to your uh bon jovi records or something yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um but yeah he, he i think you might be on to something there although i gotta be honest with you peter i didn't give it nearly the thought that you did <laughs> yeah i um, i spent a lot of time with the, the debut over the last week or so and listening to it over and over again looking at that cover art I'm reading about so like I, I I'm to be fair, I'm big on the fact in the Norse mythology, so okay. I've put loads of books on it and so um, it was good getting back into that again. Cool. Well that's a, a good place for us to transition to the next album then. Yeah. So uh, Memoria of the Two um Fathers of the Icy Age comes out in nineteen ninety six. Um once again on Impure Creation Records. We have the same lineup. Um, or the mysterious lineup from the last mysterious lineup, yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, so for this one here, I'll let um kind of get Jeff back in the mix. If you want to take your thoughts on this, your record, or, or what do you think of sure. uh, Father Icy Age? Well, first of all, I hadn't listened to this one in quite a while, so I re threw it on the day before yesterday, I guess it was, and. I think there was a, a pretty marked change in terms of the stepping the game up level. Uh, the songs on here are are very they're they're similar to Ultima Thule, only they're more developed. I think is the word I'm looking for. They're a little more developed, a little more streamlined. I still hear a lot of battery in this album. I just do, uh, the, particularly the first two or three battery albums. Uh, I hear, you know, you hear a little bit of Venom, you hear a little bit of Merciful Fade in there with some of the, the guitar lines and things like that, but it, it's, it's not derivative. And of course you definitely, uh, Peter, you definitely hear Burzum. Um, what I know, the big difference about this album over to Lee is that the vocals are better. There's, there's a better quality control over what he's doing with his voice. It's still not. You know, it's it's not. I'm trying to think. You know, it's not uh, Grutla or uh, you know, I'm trying to think of a good black metal vocalist. Um, help me out, guys. Oh man, favorite black metal vocalist? Yeah, give me a couple black black metal vocalists. I mean, I'm gonna yeah. go with. Yeah, that aren't super. That aren't super <laughs> obscure. I mean, I, I love Attila's vocals, so... Yeah, Attila. Attila's a good example. Um, they're not on that level. They're not, you know, they're not up to that that kind of panache. That uh, You can tell that that's always been the one thing that he's always grappled with is where do I... How do I use the vocals? How do I... What, 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 what do I want to convey with them? How do I want them to affect... And, you know, like I said, on the very first album, it was this, you know, haunted troll sort of voice, you know, whereas on this one, it's more of a black metal vocal. It's still it's not a top black metal vocal, but it's a lot more scary in, in a real way. And it's a lot more reined in and controlled. Um, there is some let me read my notes on this one quick here. Sure. Um, So I got the guitars aren't my favorite sound. Uh, the guitars aren't my favorite sound of his. 
and you can hear the battery influence, but there are some absolutely killer riffs on this album. It's a bit messy from a sound and mix standpoint, but the guitar playing is is quite a bit more advanced than a lot of the 90s black metal guys were capable of. His vocals are more screechy and snarling on this album. There's more snarling than screechy on this album. It's pretty epic. Again, the battery vibe is there for sure. Slaughter Day opens up and it's grand and big. And for a one-man band, if it was a one-man band, basically it's a pretty amazing uh, uh, piece of work. Uh, what's this here again? Par of Wolf Hill. Something of Wolf Hill. Second, oh, is that dwarf, the second track? Dwarf Hill. Say again. Uh, on the path of the wolf. Towards yeah, path. Dwarf Hill. Pa that's the one. Path of Wolf Hill. Epic and snarling again. The mix isn't the best, but the amazing uh, sound, the amazing mix of the guitars is kind of swallowed by the bits. Okay, I see what I was trying to say there. The mix kind of swallows the guitars a little bit in that one, but I really like it. The guitars are really killer on this album, but again, they're a bit buried in the noise of the mix. Yes, it's black metal, but it's grand. It's epic. has a lot of melodic uh, themes in these songs, a lot of melodic uh, structures. I wish he'd remix and remix, remaster that album. I think it would come out really good. The complexity of these songs isn't helped by the lackluster production, but there are some amazingly deep and complex song structures, many driven by the guitar interplay, but that said, it's still pretty godlike material for the the time, and High Brown his vocals are much cooler on this album. Uh, Sons of Wisdom has some super filthy riffs on it. Oh God, I can't even read my. You can tell I was doing this quick. Oh, I also think the synth patches stand out for the grand grandiosity. And the oddly mixed Forsaken Voices is a really thick riff track with crazed vocals and blast beats. I give this one an 8 out of 10. Um, it's pretty solid. Really solid. So that's kind of what I got on that. Okay. Uh, Peter, thoughts? Yeah, for me, I suppose um, the production was a bit punchier. Um like you said, you have the songwriting seemed a bit more uh, tighter for me. Um, I think it's very aggressive compared to the debut. I mean, I think where it loses some of the, ver the variation of the debut with the ambient parts, it's just full scale Good attack. Point. And for me, there's l there's less variation on this than there is in the debut. And, re and like we like I said, we get the lyrics for the first time. And reading those lyrics, they're they're all they're about war, fighting, death, get, like vengeance, getting revenge. I mean, it's, it's hateful this this time. Um, so I'm sort of going back to my theory about how he's landed in Thule, and he's trying to reconnect with his ancients, and he's kind of annoyed that their old ways have gone, and he's trying to defend what what little there is of of their legacy. Um, but like I said, on slower days, good. Opening and I think the bass lines are higher in the mix in this album. Yeah, I agree. First. But towards towards the end of that first song, that's where the melodic guitar kicks in, and that's the first time you really hear that melody that he comes known for in this particular. Um, well, that turns out to be a trilogy, though. In the note, in the booklet, he actually says it was going to be a two part um, sort of concept. So he never had the third one in mind at this stage. So, so that was oh, so oh, so when he started this one, he was he had a second part plan that which became yes. a, a dialogue. But the third was kind of an afterthought, I guess. Later, yeah, I'll just, I'll just read the booklet here, so you don't get much in it. But he does mention that this album is the first of a concept, and then he actually names. The second, so he, he knew oh, he wow. had it all planned out, so he had, but no wow. mention of the third one. And again, like we, we mentioned on the debut, there's no mention of WD Feld. Yeah, <laughs> again, um, there's just him. He does, he does mention a guest bass player, Ira A. Turner, whoever that is. But um, I think the cover art, too, is from Francois de Nom. French artist from the Baroque period, 
and that it's entitled Le, Lay and Fur, which translates as Hell. Hmm. Didn't look so, that far into it. That's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, this is where I started formulating this bigger theory of what's going on yeah. the story arc, you know. Um, but yeah, just a couple of you know, other notes I have here. He has like more intricate bass lines that add a wee bit of depth to the songs. Um, I actually had down here a note here that said some hints of Pestilence testimony in the guitar solo. Some hints of who? Pestilence testimony of the ancients. Um, oh, okay. The guitar hmm. solo. Um, oh, probably. It's funny. It's funny when you go back to listen to all the, these albums, like sitting on the shelves for years, and sure. you go back and listen to things. Um, the Cure, Pestilence, they keep popping <laughs> yeah. up. <laughs> yeah, you hear you hear new things that you didn't hear. Definitely. Um, I think the riffs I've got down here, riffs are kind of a bit more interesting compared to the first one. Um, um, the melodies. Um, yeah, just the guitar leads are just so impressive, like sublime. Yeah, yeah, he plays a lot of lead on here, or or more than he had on the first one, and that's yeah. that's more noticeable. And he's quite a he's quite a good guitar player. Yeah, so why we we lost the 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 more variation with the ambient parts began these melodic leads, right? Which, you know, that was kind of like the 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 merciful fate side of things because I could hear some. I put my hair up so it's not blowing in my face. It looks kind of weird. Um, <laughs> I I could hear some merciful fate like melodic lines in there that you know, or any European metal of the day. But I mean, you know, you, everyone always says, "Oh, the, you know, merciful fate or black metal." I don't really agree with that. But by the but, but by the same token, they were around a long time before all this, and they were setting the stage for a lot of this stuff. So, um, but yeah, I. I like this one a lot, and I had forgotten how much I liked it. And we should add that uh, in recent times, um, they've been reissuing a lot of that vi stuff on vinyl. I mean, I don't know if you picked that up recently, Kellen, or... Oh, yeah. This, was, know, okay. this was my... So I was going to say... Um, I was all, I'll Go ahead, take, take off, yeah. Um, Sweet. Yeah, the album artwork is gorgeous so uh i absolutely I, that is i'm happy you you brought that up peter um because it's worth noting and i think jeff your candlelight reissue of this record is the one you described previously because i waited for a vinyl reissue of this because well, maybe you're the, right maybe it was the that i won't have this like it was a very similar sort of like glacial landscape it, it had this weird coloring um, yeah, it had a strange like yellow it, color. It was it was such a poor album like cover choice for the reissue. Let me um, see if I is, can. This is so beautiful, um, just a perfect album art like piece of album artwork. I it was very disappointing that it got reissued on vinyl and that was their album artwork choice. Um, but, oh, you're right. You are right. It is. It's that yellow. I just looked it up here. It's, it, it, it looks similar to the, you know, Ultima Thule, but it just... I, it, yeah, I, it, anyway. Was that the candlelight version? That was the candlelight yeah. version. Yeah. Um, so, because that's... And it's a terrible like, cover. Like 2005 and six. so... Um, Somewhere in that range, yeah. So, I, I mean, first off, I wanted to say, there's a year here, right? We get... In 95, we get Ultima Thule. A year later, this record comes out. Um, and I think that's worth noting because this is, to your point, a dramatic stylistic shift for me. Um, I, it sounds to me like as a musician and as a songwriter, there was a whole lot more growth um, in that year than most artists typically experience. No doubt. Um I, I liked your your word, Jeff, for it, how this record feels more composed. I mean, I guess that's one way you could frame it, I, I, or concise is maybe um, another way I would describe it. It doesn't feel this. I don't have the same sort of sprawling kind of experience that I had with Dulé. Um, that record feels like it is not as 
I don't know if dense is the term or doesn't have the same sort of economy of a car, of guitar work. Um, this is a little bit more. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would agree well, with that. To your point, well composed. I agree absolutely, Peter, that there is, a, and it'll be consistent with this Memoria Vetusta series, the melodic sort of guitar work um, is a, a theme that you'll find throughout. And it's going to be like for us, as you don't want to get too far ahead, but like an interesting sort of divergence from the other kind of guitar playing that he'll get into. Um, right. I, I just overall, the my favorite um, songs on it uh, were Sons of Wisdom, uh, Master of Elements, and The Territory of Witches, Guardians of the Dark Lake, purely because it has that sort of like splintering lead work that. I think um, is pretty anthemic here. So a great record. Um, probably, I, I don't know if, you know where I would even rank it, um, but it'd be near one of my, it's one of my favorites from the catalog. Um, and it's, and for me, it shows a, a tremendous amount of growth um, from the previous release in delay. Uh, a, a, an amazing second record. Um, and I was trying to, you know, think if you're recommending someone to start with Blue House Nord, um, I, I may steer them towards this direction, especially if they're, bad one. if they're if they're coming from a more traditional black metal background. They're gonna love it in that case. Um, I mean, there's a we can. There's a whole lot of qualification. If you start recommending albums, you're like, well, let's. I have to tell a story about the journey of Vince Vault and where he was in his, you know, Blue House Nord life. But uh, I, I absolutely love this record. Um, it might not be my favorite, but uh, a tremendous piece. Maybe my foul favorite. Uh, it's close. There's two records that really um, almost tie for favorite uh, album artwork from Blue Owl Snore for me. Um, but this is up there. Uh, gorgeous pressing. If you, um, I don't know, do you have the original Impure Creations, Peter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But that's, that's it's really that's difficult to bring back the, the, the song titles. Yeah, I mean, and to your point, uh, can we just take a quick moment to talk about the lyrics here? Um, yeah, but before you do that, though, is if am I wrong by this, or is it the only album that he puts lyrics in? Because I thought I read that he only, or is there other albums that have it? I didn't pay attention, to be honest with you. Others have them? Go ahead, Peter. I thought that, I uh, you were going to jump there. I'm pretty sure there are, but... For Blood Ice Nord, I'm trying to think right now, but I, I, I do know for the side projects on the the eye, he has the lyrics. Always for that. Okay. Because I, I, I thought I read somewhere that this was the first and only album he put lyrics on. I was like, that doesn't sound right, but I didn't pull my CDs. So, what I would say to Peter's point, and I, I think he, I was agree, like just going through these last, whatever, uh, seven, eight records here. I think this is the only one with complete. Okay, lyrics. that's what. I, okay, that might be what I was. What I had read. Um, that's probably I've, what I read. I've seen them sparingly um, in other. Yeah, records. like a, a few lines or something like that, but yeah. not the full, the full thing. And that's. I think that's because, like Peter said, you know, he he wants everyone to find what they can, and in a lot of ways, the lyrics aren't really that important to the overall picture i think i wouldn't be able to tell you what he's saying 99 percent of the time i would need to google translate it from french into english but, well that's uh, true that's a good point yeah but i mean i it's, it's it is an interesting thing though because it seems to me a, a, like a degree of personal conviction in one's art like i would love to know what he's saying 
what he's writing about. Um, right. I do think he's probably, he has, if you look at his literary influences as well, oh, he's, he's smart. He, he's writing meaningful lyrics and they're on this record. Um, so they aren't necessarily just like your generic, much like his music. I, 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 I would investigate them as much as a, as a fan. I, but I don't think he really like, this is not for you, you know? Right. Um, Right, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> and and you know, in the same way, this I think the way the one thing that I that he said one time, and this was later on in his career, because at this point, um, he had been you know with a very visible act within black metal. He said there's nothing wrong with success. The the what is I'm paraphrasing here, but what's the problem is the road to success, and uh, he has stood by, you know, certain aspects of what Blue House Nord and how much it means to him personally and does not feel like he wants to compromise for anyone um, in order to fulfill that sort of artistic vision. And, Good for him. I, and, and the lyrics are part of that for some reason. It's, it's just yeah, self yeah. It's I, I, I don't like that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would love to be able to go through these records and, and find the lyrics, but unfortunately we can't, so. You know, lyrics with extreme metal tend to be a lesser important thing but i got a feeling with him his lyrics are pretty highbrow they're pretty it's elevated conceptual stuff you know yeah and i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised if you were to look through some of the box sets that you have if you you know there's there are quotes i know just from some of the albums that i have um probably is there are you know he, there's poems and mm -hmm. he's included that have inspired him and so forth so yeah. he, he um it, I would, for me, selfishly, I would like to have them more often, but unfortunately. Um, okay. Well, maybe so when I, he see, maybe when he sees this, he'll contact one of us sure. and say, "Hey, guys, yeah. guys, I'm you sure. guys want to hang out and talk my lyrics?" I'm sure he'll throw three decades of artistic conviction out the window in order to for us. A deep dive. <laughs> for yes, us. bunch bunch of fucking nerds yeah. on YouTube. <laughs> okay, maybe so can, uh, maybe prove or disprove my theory. Yes. True. Yes. <laughs> um. If hey, Peter, when you when you s start watching the comments, if you see some like thing in the in the co a comment that says V S Dale with two thumbs down, you know it's probably him. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, your story, your RPG, nice going, dude. Now yeah. I think you'd probably find it, and you know what, you may be a lot closer to right than you think. So, go ahead, Council. Um, I just wanted to take so this is the moment where we kind of want to take a quick little detour. Yeah. Um, so, Peter, I'm going to I'm going to put you on the spot here um, because we have a, a gap. You know, we we have, we have two records within in two years and then Blue House Nord kind of falls. Goes on hiatus. Yeah, it goes on hiatus. Um, but it's not like Vince Vall was not uh, putting out music. Um, he's been prolific throughout you know, this time period. So um, I actually want to take a I'll. I'll Put you on the spot here, Peter, and uh, and just to kind of give you the the stage to talk about the work that he'd been doing in this time. Yeah, so um, we just spoke about how the Fathers of the Ice Age was released in '96. So a year later, he actually released uh, this album, which is called "The Eye," and the name of the album is "Supremacy." So this was released on Velvet Music International, which was previously known as Impure Creations. So it was a French label that, that changed its name. Um, it's actually quite limited, this one. I think it was only 500 copies released. Um, but for me, this is like a return to Ultima Thule. So um, it's probably a bit more closer to traditional orthodox black metal than Ultima Thule. Um, he's always sort of seen as a solo project and lyrically, which the lyrics are, are published, it's a shift away from the Norse mythology. And I think they're, pro they're more personal lyrics. Um, still has the keyboards in it. Generally, the, the black metal is mid-paced. Um, in the booklet, he calls it misanthropic black metal. Um, the production is spot on for this. I mean, for black metal, it's it's quite good actually. You know, all the instruments are pretty clear. 
Um, I think the song on this is well, the lyrics are like, like I said, personal. But kind of, there's parts that are steeped in nature, and, and it's views on religion, which, um, as you can expect, he's not very fond of. Um, sure. <laughs> but yeah, that, that that there came out there. There's typical Finn's file. There's very little other information in the the booklet, so. I don't exactly know when it was recorded, but because it reminds me of Old Methuley, it's quite possible he recorded it back in '95. Same same period of time. Yeah, because we move on then. The following year, he releases an EP under the moniker of Children of Mammy, and it's called The Veil of Osiris. So, as you can see from the front there, and obviously the title, he's starting to delve into Egyptian mythology. But in this one here, there's no lyrics. Um, the music itself, it, it's released again on Velvet, Velvet uh, Music International. Um, and again, it's, I think it's quite limited. Um, so I don't know how easy it is to find these days. Well, yeah, so the, the Children of Mani, um, he does have some liner notes in the booklet and he mentions that it's produced in 1995. So this is probably a bit more melodic black metal, kind of techno, and there's hints of death metal throughout the music. Um, the vocals are quite raw, but he has an occasional growl. I mean, listen to the game, it kind of reminded me of a tiny bit of Martin Fandrin. The, the death metal ground. Now, it's not that um, often he uses it in the album, but it, it does pop up. I mean, the, the song titles seem to be related to the, the, the Kabbalah as well mm. as these Egyptian themes. So if he's made, produced this and recorded this in 95, but doesn't release it till 98, I mean, we're talking earlier about how he's about 16. He's de deep into the Norse mythology, but then he's had a sidetrack into Egyptian and Kabbalistic themes. That he was, he was probably listening. He was probably hooked up with Carl Sanders somehow. Probably, probably was a big Nile fan or something <laughs> around that time. <laughs> wow, I didn't realize that. That's pretty trippy. Yeah, so Deep I mean, dive. it's a, it's about twenty minutes in length, but it it, it came out in '98, and to be fair, I was probably more familiar with these than I was with the first two, Blue Eyes North, because wow. you could pick these up in uh, distro. So I don't know if it was to do with it, with the label change of name. Did I get extra? distribution or finance behind it, I don't know. But it was a quite a short-lived um, label. I mean, like, there's bands on it, like, I took a couple of notes because of a few of these as well. Um, Wallachia, Wallachia, which is a Nor Norwegian black metal band. Right. Uh, Sephiros, which is a, the, the Greek black metal band. You know, but then it's, it seems that died off, this label. Right. Like, it lasted two years, right? It Something looks like, like yeah. So, so I'm just wondering because impure creations, you know, is essentially transitions into this. I, I kept on wondering, do you think part of the reason that these were released were sort of pushed out that he potentially was concerned that they would not, there would not be time. Like he saw the writing on the wall from the labels and thought there's an opportunity to put some music out that he otherwise wouldn't get released or I'm just well, curious. Because uh, I, I was digging through um, Terrorizer, I was digging through old uh, Metal Maniacs um, of a few other sort of magazines and signs from that, that late 90s period. And there's no interviews at all of them that I could find. So I don't know what his thinking was through this whole period, but mm. it seems strange. Maybe you look at the discography wise, you're not from 96 to 2001. Well, you know, he probably had these recorded years earlier. He's starting to by the mouth, and then there's a three year gap now. So, what is he up to? Hmm. Right. Yeah, well, we may never know. Okay, well, that leads us here. Are, are you everything you, you wanted to kind of touch on there, Peter? No, that was everything. It was just I thought it'd be okay. important to mention because. Yeah. Well, yeah, and I just and I just not give them a I've never given them a shot, even though I knew about them because I saw you post about what a couple months ago, maybe five, six months ago. 
And I was like, oh, I got to go look them up. And then you know how it is. You get buried in other shit and you just forget about it. So I didn't get a chance to check them out. But I'll, I'll try to go back and I mean, give a both, listen. And it's both of still the signature Vince Val sort of riffs okay. and songwriting. So maybe okay. if you were to meet someone who was new to the band, I would say the yeah, eyes probably, like I said, probably the closest to orthodox black metal you're going to get with him. And then you can maybe Children of Mana, you can ease them in, and then maybe Fathers of the ICH could be your next go to album. All right. Cool. Um, cool. Well, let's here move on to uh, 2001. So we get to uh, Mystical Beast of Rebellion, uh, which was released on Oakenshield. Um, and I'll let you take the stage here, Jeff, and you can lead on. Your thoughts right. on Mystical Beast. Okay. So Mystical Beast. Um, I, this one's been on my radar for a long time, but I'm going to be totally honest with you. I only listened to it like one other time a couple years ago. And I did not like what I heard. It was not. It, it was, first of all, the, 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 it, it sounded to me very much like the same track over and over and over and over and over again. Uh, it's probably being a little too simplistic. Anyway, so when I listened to this, I kind of knew ahead because I started reading back about other albums. I kind of knew this might be the one that doesn't work well for me. And so I listened to it, like I said, maybe three, four years ago. Didn't see the need to pick it up at the time and thought, you know what? One of these days, if it's the last thing I need, I'll grab it. If not, I'll keep looking for it in a used bin. Um, and that was kind of it. I threw it in two days ago. And honestly, my opinion of it has not changed much at all. Um, keeping in mind that I'm not raw black metal boy. You know, I'm just not. And this is probably the closest he's going to come to what I'd call raw black metal. You know, unrelenting, just in your face blast beats, searing uh, chainsaw buzzing guitar. Not an HM2 buzz, though. I want to make sure I point that out. It's not an HM2 buzz, but it's not far off. He, he didn't want to go straight HM2 to be super derivative. He, he, he did still retain some of his weird tone, but it just, I, I have to say, man, I listened to each track about today in, in prepping for this, just to re remind myself, and I really, first of all, too many of the tracks are way too long. There are six, seven, eight minutes long. Six, I think there's at least three six-minute ones and one or two that's eight. And I think there's one that's ten, I believe. I think there's a ten-minute song. Um, and it just, there's no flow to it. It's all one speed. It's all, to, to my ears. Now, maybe you guys are going to tell me I'm fucked in the head. And that's fine. But, and, I'm, and you might be right. But it just did nothing for me. And I tried. I listened to I listened to it enough and I just realized, nah, I don't ever need to really hear that. I don't need to own it. Strangely enough, some people that are really into blue, like maybe Peter's gonna say, That's my favorite album, you know. And that's the one he came in on, so that wouldn't shock me. But I think that may have had a lot to do with it. But I also think Peter's got a much deeper, longer, closer relationship to raw or black metal and that's what this album is for me this is blue house nord's real there's other stuff coming up in the second part that's weird super tra uh, experimental almost atonal and dissonant and one or two of them they're very very borderline listenable but this one here was just to me it was just like listening to the same song over and over and over and over again and i would honestly only give this like a three okay Okay. So that, that's me. Yeah. Coming in strong. Okay. Coming in hot. <laughs> yes. Okay. So is this, Peter, this is the album that you were introduced to Blue Dow Snort. So, you know, now having a whole lot more experience with them, what are your thoughts? It might have been my introduction. Um, and normally for me, that usually means I have, would hold that record in high regard. I still think it's a good record. It's not one of my favorite, yeah. So I, I think for me, 
because I was new to it, I didn't know what Vince Val had been doing before. It felt very much like there was a movement at that time, I think, in black metal. And I think it was a reaction against the symphonic, sort of gothic um, black metal that the, began to dominate the scene. Yeah, the demo borgers, the demo borgers kind of and stuff, stuff yeah. like that, yeah. So, because at the same time, you got an Alan Nathrak had come on the scene with a codec. Codex ne- Negro, and they got that. They're adding kind of industrial grind to their black metal. And Thorns released, finally released. Thorns, a uh, killer album. Their, yeah, so and any of Dunhams Garden had Six 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 International. Um, yeah, so what year was this again? What year was this again? Two thousand and one. So two thousand one. Okay. I think this is almost, and I'm not sure if this is what Finn's fault thing was, but for me, it, it sort of came along with that movement that was kind of like a reaction to that. And it was bringing black metal back into the sort of press of force. Interesting, I, there is very, a, a very little variation for me in this album, but I think that's what he intended. Um, and I can enjoy it on certain days, and it's almost that trance like feeling that brings you into. Um, it's not an album I return to that often. Um, I did enjoy it. Um, actually, we had a heat wave last week, and I was out in the, in the garden. I was lying in the sun listening to it. I was enjoying it. <laughs> but when I was listening to it in the house during the week, I was kind of after a while, I think I was waiting for it to be over, and maybe that ties into what Jeff was saying about the songs being maybe too long. Um, I just think that lack of variation after a while is like I'm not in the mood for that. I need to be in the right mood for it. But yeah, for you're talking. Was... You're talking an album that's pushing fifty minutes of not a lot of variety, and yeah. that to me, if that was his intention, okay. Um, I'm not sure why, because he's vi- to me, he's always been quite a master at at creating a lot of diverse sounds and universes of sounds, and so maybe that was his fuck you to what was going on at the time in 2001, yeah. but you know, cause I guess you had what, when did over come out? Was that was over in the nineties? Yeah. Right? So they, yeah. Right. Yeah. That was 95. So I'm wondering if it was kind of that, you know, but even that Bergtad is quite a unique album in the way that it sounds. It doesn't, this just sounded for me, this to me, honestly, I'm not going to lie. This is probably my least favorite blue dots Nord album other than maybe the two weird ones that he does splits with uh, me. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it. They're, they're coming up in the second part. Okay, there well, there's, there's one is a split. It's something uh, Omega Integra something or whatever. And then the other one is um, it's the Mia something, something Mia, whatever. Not Mia Culpa, but whatever that album is. I don't have it off the top of my head. I have it. But that one's very dis- difficult to listen to, too. Um, and this one would be in that vein because it just doesn't... At least those other ones are kind of... There's some variety to it. This just, like I said, maybe I'm wrong. Tell me I'm wrong, Kellen. But it just sounded like the same song over and over and over again. So you could have a hard it's time really dark. It. Yeah. Is it... Yeah, we What'd can't read, read, it, read, it, read it for us. Undangerous so music? It says underground and said underground. Uh, musical musical terrorism. Uh, musical terrorism. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So but he was sending me, a message, maybe. Okay. Yeah. So I think this so, is what you were holding. This is the right here. I'll blow myself up so I can. I think I think you're t- holding up the Oak and Shield release, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Underground. Musical terrorism. Okay. So, that's um, cool. it's, um, it's the first. It's it's. He changed the logo first art, the fonts changed. Um, and he does, he, he's done away with song titles, so it's just chapter. Yeah. Right. And then um, for me, I do like chapter five. It's probably my favorite. I think that's the one I, I gravitated to most, too. Yeah. And, and this is where the sort of glove flesh industrial influences are starting to come through a wee bit. Um, and it slows, it's got that slower pace. And had a sort of oppressive sort of atmosphere about it, you know. Yeah. Right. 
yeah, all right, I so I wasn't I, – I, I had pegged you were probably going to pick that as your number one, so I don't know you as well as I thought I did. <laughs> That's good. Um, so I am I'm probably a little bit higher on this record, but not because necessarily on its own. Um, I think it's a standalone great Blue Dow Snored release. Um, I, for me, it's very much a transitional album. It is – and – because I do it, the album that follows is one that means so much to me personally. Um, going back and listening to this, it gives me a bit more musical context. And I, I like that you brought up sort of the, the industrial sort of influence that is starting to appear um, at this time within black metal. I think so I do think that is, you know, a, a part of the story is I remember listening you know, the album artwork and listening to Thorns when it first came out. And that was another record that was being a lot that I didn't touch, you know, I didn't listen to Mystical Beast, um, but I listened to Thorns a lot. Um, mm -hmm. And this record for me, so uh, the chapter five, um, I absolutely agree that not only is the pacing, but I also think the the vocals, you start, start to see him play with, different kind of vocal effects and personalities um, on that track. There's that sort of very, it's a much lower level, but there's some sort of effect or reverb that's happening with his vocals. sense it's this all this artistic growth happening he's understanding how he wants to marry his blue to Nord sound with an industrial sort of um influence he's growing you know in that regard um but i don't think he's really understand how understands how he wants to you know optimize all those influences on this record so it ends up just being sort of like an introduction to a certain kind of sound rather than a fully realized artistic vision. Um, but I, I, I keep on listening to this record and like, this is the beginning. Um, I also want to get into Jeff, the guitar work here. Um, because I, for the first time, this is when that sort of rounded distortion, I also see becomes a bit more prominent. Um, where guitar work does not resolve cleanly is a weird sort of effect where he's sort of bending the notes and bending the chords um, on this. He gets, I think that is a, something that he'll improve on later. Um, but right. it's also the first time I think where we get a glimpse into how as a guitar player, he wants to warp the sound of Blue House Nord in the future. Um, you don't get yeah, the follow with that sort of, that's a, that's a good that's a good point because while I still hear a lot of straightforward ahead kind of um, you know you got the blast beat rhythm section in the background you got a lot of noise like you know that he introduces a lot of noise to the field now because we've got the industrial sort of realization starting to come to the fore um, he's not fully warping the guitar like he starts to on uh, the next album but i see what you're saying there's a there's a little bit more of a rounding is a good way of putting it where the the a lot of the chords slide into one another rather than they're they're not angular and jagged and like the, the, they're not start stoppy sort of thing they're not punk riffs or something like that um and i think it's much more noticeable much more pronounced on the work that transforms god but it, it's definitely here you know this just is an album that I maybe maybe I need to give it more time because it's been a long time and then I had to kind of rush through it because I knew it was one that I didn't particularly care the first time around. So I probably went into a slight with slightly more preconceived notions about it. Um, so I, I probably should go back and 
try to dig through, but I'm not one of those people that wants to listen to like seven minutes of the same riff over and over and over. Especially, you know, yes, there's a few killer riffs out there I can listen to endlessly, but they're usually not in black metal. It's just that's not how it's happened. You know, it's just, you know, I mean, there's, I hate to say it, most of the really good riffs you can listen to over and over and over again are classic rock songs or, you know, where it's, the effect is different. When you're listening to something that's coming at your jugular and your ear holes so aggressively and it's not really catchy, but it goes on and 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 you're kind of like, whoa, man. But I get it. And again, like I said, I'm not black. I'm not black metal boy. So that it's it's a harder sell for me. A lot of people be like, well, if you don't like black metal, what do you even listen to Blue Dots North for? Well, because I don't really think he's predominantly all black metal. But I like, you know, I like a lot of black metal. It's just I don't like I don't like black metal. I have to work hard for That's the truth. That's probably the best way to put it. And this one I'd have to work hard to really like. Sure. And I, and I, I absolutely agree that you can probably get everything right. Like if you are a completist, like, you know, myself, I love it just because it's an introduction to the or a little piece of the story, right? Like it's, it, the door starts to open. We get the party in the next room over, right? Like that's going to, that's on its way. And so I would understand yeah, right. you just want to go and go for that record when you want this sound from him. Um, right. From Blood House Nord, but for me, it's I, you get a glimpse into what's on its way and what would be all would ultimately sort of um, throw Blue House Nord out into the forefront of the conversation in terms of important black metal band. That's a good point. That's a great point. Can't argue that at all. Yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm not a musician at all, um, but for me, it's listen to the riffs. There's like there's a lot of unresolved tension. In those songs that you don't get any relief from. That's why it could be a tough lesson, maybe for some people. For sure. Okay, well, we've teased this record enough. So let's um let's jump into it here. So uh I'll let you since you probably enjoy this next record more than the previous one. Um oh yeah, yeah. So this to me yeah, let me just do the quick little intro. Yeah, go for it. So uh, the work which transforms God, 2003. Um, so originally a release on um, Appease Me Records. Um, but I do think it's worth mentioning here. This is in 2004, I believe. Blue House Nord signs with Candlelight. Um, and that is a huge, um, makes a huge impact. I, I, I don't even know interviews that Vince Vault had said that you know, to some degree, the black metal community um, dismissed him for making such a, a transition, moving to a larger label. Um, wow, really? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't as, aware of that. Uh, it, it's but like a many, you know, underground, you know, it, at this time, I think, especially within black metal, um, moving towards larger labels, larger, sure. and there's going to be some degree of pushback from the community. You were sell, you were selling out. Well, right. uh, that's interesting, but since uh, when Candlelight started, it was the underground label sure. of the Emperor, you know. And... Oh, big time. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I, so while originally released under um, Appease Me, I think that in 2004, it's where I heard it, you know, and probably come, being in the States, probably it was different than, I don't know what kind of access you had in, in Europe, Peter, but um, so... I'm going to jump to here and let you uh, get on this, Jeff. You can talk about the okay. work. Okay, so I have some notes on this one. And um hadn't listened to this one in a long time, and I do not own this one. It's one I've had in my hands and had in my cart and almost bought a number of times, but I just didn't. That was a mistake. Um, I forgot how good this is. The work that transformed God, this is the album that Vince Vol in my opinion, put a statement to the rest of the, the metal community. This is what Blue Dots Nord is about. And the future direction where you hear that proggy, watery, 
weirdery guitar, that atonal, dissonant, rounding guitar that never quite... It's like he's doing chordal progressions that never quite get to where they're supposed to get, but yet they work. And they should They shouldn't sound like they do. They should be jarring and just difficult to... Uh, difficult to assimilate into your brain when you're listening to them. But for me, that was what really caught me about desanctification, about cosmosophy. To a lesser degree, they're not as egregious on those albums, but you hear this weird guitar style that only he does. Like, I, I now, let me let me pop back on for one second here because we, uh, before I go finish my notes, we talked about this before you came on, Peter, that this album really to me even though um Despel omega was around in 98 i think this album and the one prior probably really set a good template for a lot of these weird french avant-garde bands french, french black metal bands because you can definitely hear that uh uh Despel omega Love him or hate him, love him, you know, Miko Ospod seems like an absolute awful human being. But, you know, I, ha I have some black, uh, some Despo, uh stuff that I bought before I knew about what, you know, the political ideology and the, you know, Miko Ospa. And there's good stuff on there, man. There's some bizarro fucking stuff. I mean, there's bizarre angular chords. And I'm telling you right now, man, they had to have been listening to uh, Vince Vaughn. There's just no way they couldn't have. They had to have known about him. And that was really his signature thing because I really cannot point to that in any other metal guitar player that they're doing this weird recording thing where they're actually, what it sounds a lot like often is that the guitars are being sped up and slowed down. And they're being, they're morphing in and out of the sounds that they make and they're otherworldly sounds. They just don't, Yes, you know their guitars, but you're like, man, it just sounds, it sounds like a, you know how like if you hear a trombone where you, the guy, you know, goes, you know, he pulls the, the, the thing out and goes, you know, that's what he's doing on the guitar. He's distorting and twisting that guitar, those chords and notes by glissandoing and sliding and doing something with the recording process. I, I, you can't do that. You can't play that way. It's not like you can play like, you can't you can't play that way you have to do that in post-production and with effects and all that stuff and it became very much what i feel is the signature vince vol blue dots nord sound um real quick on the notes to finish opens with a droning intro into choir of the dead blast beats weird sliding slippery almost atonal yet mel melodic out of tune guitar works that you hear later in crushing BAN work is in your face. The recording and mix are a little wonky to me, but that could be the YouTube rip I was listening to. It sounded like the drums were way high in the mix, and I think it might have been the uh, YouTube link I had. Axis is another good track. Lots of nightmare, nightmare sounds, atmospheres, which then moves into the fall, which is an ambient interlude, then drones into metamorphosis, which is kind of slow and mid-tempo with twisted warp vocals. Uh, Supreme. I just wrote down like one word of the title. Supreme's up next, and not a fan of those that track at all. The drums are just blast beats, and there's not much dynamics in that song. My favorite song is probably Our Blessed Cells, uh, which is twisted, weird, and atonal, bizarre, lots of mechanical machinations in the background mix, sweeping warped chords. Yep, this is BAN. I dig a lot of spacey trip. I dig the spacey trippy section in Dev. Devik, Devikish, what's Are the you, one before? What's the one before Howling of God? Devilish Essence. Devilish Essence. That, I got Devikish. <laughs> is a cool interlude. Yeah. <laughs> howling, Howling of God is pretty maniacal. Again, the vocals are a little cheesy, but all black metal vocals are kind of cheesy to me sometimes. This one is just okay. <laughs> kind of monotonous. That song. Plus the dual mach the drum machine is pretty off on it. Uh, the Oh, that one that I was talking about, the uh, Howling of God, has a strange, almost trip hop beat to it. It's kind of, kind of bizarre. It's like I, uh, I, I, inter I interludes again, more guitar center, procession of dead clowns. That's the big epic 
closer, really progressive, sounds, again, without, you know, if they'd had real drums on it, it would sound super spooky and spectral. Eight and a half out of ten. I know, is this the one that there's a bonus disc with? I have the, I have the EP that came after it. Separate. Okay, yeah. I think it came out it, it on a recent reissue, maybe like in the last ten years. I think they added that into the set. They added that EP, right. um, which I did not. I could not find that online anywhere, so I couldn't listen to it. But that's all I got. Well, I, know, I know going back to Mystical Beast. When it, I noticed one one day I was just listening on YouTube when I was out in the garden, and it went into a, a, a chapter seven, I think. And then when I checked that these are there's like three parts to this chapter seven that was on a reissue. Oh, is that the one that's, that's not, 19 minutes long? One of them's like super long? Possibly, yeah. I think that, might be what, that might be what I'm thinking of then, Peter. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. But I, I missed it. So go ahead, Peter. What do you got? Um, well, I, I think for this one, for the guitar sound, I, think you, I don't think there's too much more I could really add um, in that aspect. Um, for me, this I didn't get the, the Pays Me version. Um, it was actually the candlelight version I got, and that was probably down to it being in the albums of the year in Terrorizing. I, I, I suppose for me back then, I wasn't sure if I was after the Missy Old Beast. You know, it wasn't like it was in any real rush to go out and keep banning them, but their albums, but they were on the, the end of year list, so I did go and check it out. And I mean, <laughs> it's for me after that intro, which is called End. Um, and that first song kicks in. For me, that that, that almost sick, sounds like a continuation of Missy Old Beast. But then after that track, that's when it just changes for me. It's just, yeah. you, got, you got those guitars. I wrote here, it's like the sound of falling into the abyss. Um, and you're just totally out of control from, from here on in, really. And... Again, I noted down it was released at a time when there was a, that kind of movement within Black Metal to add in all these industrial sort of dissonant elements. Um, the, for me, the vocals are quite disturbing. It's almost like they're a sound from some ancient recording that's trying to skip through the speakers or something, or, or, or like message me for the come and help them and save them from somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, our Blessed Frozen Cells, that song you mentioned, Jeff, yeah, very industrial influence. Uh, the mechanical parts are juxtaposed with the, for me, sublime, epic, melodic guitars. Yes. Which are, um, the Hermit of God, I had down danceable drum beats, <laughs> set to sort of anger, dissonant sort of riffs. Is that uh, the one that I was talking about, that trip hop beat? Yeah. yeah. It's so weird. It's like you hear it and you're like, wait a minute, that sounds like fucking like Aphex Twin or, or something like that and you know you know he has a pretty wild wide palette of music mm -hmm. but I think also maybe we should have and if we didn't say this maybe you did say this Kellen um, I think this album shows more of the electronic direction that he's going to take on future things like Desanctification and Sect and some of these other albums where he doesn't go full on electronica, but he pulls a lot of electronica into it. And I think this is the first album that, yes, there's some on mystical, but it's very one dimensional there. Here it gets a little more 2D, 3D. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Peter. Um, and Inner Mental Cage, there's that monk, monk like chanting, which probably at the time I didn't probably pay too much attention to. But going back through all these albums again, and even looking. At what the album we're going to finish on in this session, you know, he's getting into like Buddhist meditation and transcendental meditation and Vipassana sana meditation. So, I mean, this is where I think there's this thread that links through everything. And, and we talked about it earlier where this guy set out, he knows what he wants to do with all, the album, with all these albums, he knows where he's going. Um, and finishing off that procession of the, the dead clowns, I mean, it's that's just tormenting that song. But um, I think in, in the Terrorizer um, review, I always remember they said that the drums were like the Cocteau Twins' debut garland. And it was that review that set me off getting into Cocteau Twin. 
Ah. That is weird. That I, where did you read that in and terrorize? So Ter yeah, so Terrorizer had it, I think, number four or five in the, their top 40 albums from... Yeah. Well, they had it in 2004, obviously, because Candlelight released in 2004, but it originally came out in 2003. That is a really unique point, because you can definitely hear it if you know Cocktail Twins, and I love Cocktail Twins. It's just amazing music. But the, very, but the, the real limitation in that band was the drum machine. It sounds good in the context of the songs, but it's it's limited. It's not like today's drum machines where you plug into a computer and there's a nine million piece kit where you can do the most ex insane stuff. Back then, drum software was pretty rudimentary at the you know end of the 90s. You didn't have 9,000 things to choose from. So your beats were kind of, what do I want to call it? Um, yeah, you had the rolling ones where you could set them up and you could do out a pattern and then quantize it and loop it and all that kind of stuff. But it wasn't like today's stuff. And so that's weird that you brought that up, but I totally hear that now that you say that it's like, that's it right there. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Cocktail twins. If you don't know cocktail twins, Callan, you should. I, I do know them. Yeah. But okay. I, I, you, I'm sure I would defer to both your expertise on them, but. Oh God. Liz Fraser's voice. Oh my God. Otherworldly man. And she didn't really sing in english she made her own language no, up. that's right yeah she's right. irish right she's irish right or is scottish irish? i think the word oh scottish okay is there anything there Go you ahead, wanted Cal. to add uh peter or are you kind of tied a bow on no i'm happy to pass on so. okay um yeah i think uh so the all the songs you talked about were on my list um uh the other one that I really did like is uh, Metamorphosis, um, and it's just for the guitar work there. But um, yeah, Howling of God, I, that one for me, to your point, it, Desantification is the first thing I thought when I heard that song was like, this is something that is uh, on its way. Like he's sort of started to unravel something, um, which is added to the diversity of this record. Uh, because that's what really separates it from uh, Mystical Beast for me, is I can still return to this record now, you know, 20 years later, one of the, the first Blue Al Snored records I heard and still find things because of its diversity that to enjoy or just like rediscover, um, which great records usually offer you, is the ability to sort of continually pull it off the shelf and you not only have like the affection of, you know, nostalgia, but you also are still sort of enjoying um, or discovering new things about it. Um, an, an amazing, an amazing record, and I think a, a high point in the catalog of Blue House Nord. I don't know if any of the industrial albums ever reached this sort of zenith um, afterwards. They've probably embellished on certain themes, but in terms of this moment in Blue House Nord's career. A, a sense of arrival, I guess, is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, it yeah. just it put them on, on, a, on a stage, put Vince Vaughn on the stage in a way that the other records hadn't. Um, and I think because of its success, I the people who continually return to the band or people who discover the band who are new fans do so thanks to the visibility and success of this record. I agree. Here's the thing. Oh, sorry, Peter. Go ahead. I was, I was just going to say quickly. Uh, I think that you talked about those other sort of black metal industrial albums don't quite reach this limit. And I think it's because he he melds those elements in seamlessly to what he's doing with the guitars and the whole aesthetic, I suppose, of the the albums. It becomes one. Like, I mean, one sort of 
long drawn out thematic sort of piece. Right. Um, where there was other bands that they never really quite. It was always kind of like industrials tacked on to the back metal. I completely agree with that. I think that's a, a beautiful way to phrase it. Instead of like trying to merge, here we've got two sort of different genres. What happens if we bring them together? Um, I don't think this to me, Blue House Nord didn't have to sort of reconcile two opposing ideas. Yeah. Um, it was it's a, a sound that he understood what a, once again, the amount of control and vision he has as an artist. So understands what it needs to sound like and doesn't make any compromises getting there. Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful way to phrase it in terms of um, having it, it be a record that isn't trying to sort of bring the two opposing genres together as much as it just um, something that is seamlessly, you know, whole. Well, I think, I think too, a good way to look at it, 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 maybe I'm just reiterating what you guys said. Um, sorry, why did I go We're completely, I'm completely black suddenly. I don't know what happened there. Um, cause my phone's charging. That's kind of odd. Anyway. Um, I think that with this album and this was Oh three, you said Peter, right? Oh three, Oh four. Yeah. So uh, it came out on Oh three, three appease me as own label. Right. Yeah. And the light picked it up and re-released it in 2004. I really think this was the the nexus of what he was searching for in terms of creating his own real identity. Because what did we say on the first two albums? We immediately went and compared it to Battery, right? So, and it's not because it's not good, and it's not because it's um, there isn't some originality on it. It's because the template was there and it reminded us of a band we already knew or, or, or familiar with. Right. And then I named a couple other bands and you guys all named a couple bands and it's like, okay, what I hear on this album is unlike anyone else I've ever heard. It is, it is there. It is his sound. It is this band sound. It is this collective of whatever it is that he's doing genre wise he's a he's made an amalgam of a sound here that is solely his own because they're just i'm telling you there just isn't anybody that sounds like it and if they do the few i named death spell as one that kind of sounds like kind of not a lot but some it to me it's almost unfathomable that they didn't rip off some of that weird dissonant strange hanging portal guitar playing that's you know almost unsettling and you know what they, they had to have heard it from him i just feel that's pretty definitive you know they're fellow frenchmen and or whatever they are no they're not french are they Despel. no they are french yeah, they are french. but miko's not french though right correct no but he, he, he's, he's like he's the vocalist i think but the, the two main guys who write the music are french yeah that's what i thought so yeah, this is a unique album. That being said, though, and as much as I do like it, it's probably on my fringe top five. It's probably not in my top five. Um, and the main reason is because the vocals still have a little bit of silliness on occasion. The drum machine just... Uh, I just hate drum machines. Man. <laughs> Even when they're done good, I hate them. Even in Cocteau Twins, I never loved them. But... um. You know, that, that would be my two biggest arguments, that that's it. But, you know, I think the other big thing, and I think you guys have said it. I don't know if you said the word, but if you didn't say the word, I'm going to say the word. If you did say the word, I apologize, my sick brain. Um, atmosphere. This album has just tons of atmosphere, and it's very unique to itself. It's a unique place in the metal, in the music fear it just doesn't sound like anyone else and that's that's pretty fucking cool to me you know so, so can I ask a, a, quick, a quick tangent here um because i'm not a huge industrial fan so i'm curious one i think i know jeff is i don't know if you're a big uh, industrial fan too peter but i'm just curious from someone if you are or you're coming from that background and you hear blue Snord. 
I mean, is it something that you immediately identified with? Did you initially at some point think like, I don't want this with my black metal? Um, is it something that you enjoyed? Like, do you th I just am curious in terms of someone who has background knowledge, experience, and affection with the genre. How? Because for me, I just thought this is a new page for black metal. Um, I didn't necessarily think of it as, you know, here comes industrial within a different genre. So I'm curious how you approach that. Well, for me, well I suppose uh, industrial, yeah. I grew up with uh, Godflesh, Pitch Shifters, and all the first uh, Eric cassettes I ever got back in, that was uh, desensitized. I think it was in 92. Um, things like Bands like Dead World, where they mixed industrial and death metal. But for, for me, for me at, at this point, at, at this stage, this this is moving beyond the realms of black metal for me. Um, and I know Vince Fowl said black metal is a feeling, not so much a musical style. So I suppose there is that a feeling there, that oppressive sort of that darkness there in this album, but. This album, and, and we move into the, the next two years, I suppose. For me, it, it, it transcends black metal. Um, I don't have a problem with it. If you want to call it black metal or industrial black metal, but it starts to become its own thing for me. It's, uh, it's a dark place. <laughs> for sure. sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I came, when I came in, I came uh, from listening to bands like Skinny Puppy. Uh, and loving Skinny Puppy and loving bands like Frontline Assembly and Numb and Ministry not as much but I, I enjoyed Ministry, the first couple of Ministries, I got sick of that after a while so, you know, but I'm not I'm not this mega in, industrial guy, I, there, I, again I pick and choose what I like but what I, what I heard in bands like Frontline Assembly adding guitars, heavy guitars to synthesizers that were doing loops and all that kind of keep in mind guys i go back to the ogs of craft work and tangerine dream for my my electronic fix usually and so you know what i think vince vall has been doing is he's taking various different genres that he has some affinity for and has an ability to mix and that's what he started to do here and we'll see it more more prevalently on the next two albums obviously and then then he kind of gets off of it for an album or two then he kind of goes back into it again at a more elevated level um so yeah i what peter said this is all this it, it clearly this guy's always had sort of a plan and he's Unlike a lot of people who try to mix genres and can't really do it, he's been able to do it. You know, and and I mean, but I'm not gonna lie. Generally speaking, the more industrial albums are my least favorite of his. Okay. So the more, but that actually changes coming up here with what we're gonna talk about because one of them I really really liked, and the other I was pretty indifferent on. But um, so go ahead. Um, cool. So let's move on here. 2006 okay so uh mort or metamorphosis of uh realistic theories um is released in 2006 on candlelight records um i mean this is a pretty amazing record and it's a good sort of segue from the conversation we were having in regards to how this project relates to a genre like um, at black metal and sort of Vince Vault's willingness to sort of separate himself from that. Um, once again, sort of this theme of being committed to uh, his work, his art, his inspiration, um, and not wanting to have to break from that. So um, Mort's a pretty different record. Um, I think that's kind of a safe statement here. Um, I'll, uh, I'll let, you know, Peter, if you want to jump in and kind of talk about, you know, what your thoughts on more are and, and um, listening to it recently, what did you think? Okay. Uh, so for me, I mean, 
listening to this again after a while, I've just noted down a few things. So it's um, like a, a slithering, swirling, formless, dissonant, atonal, descent through urban decay, full of horror and absolute regression. Um, I mean, it's like the focals are spurred from another dimension. For me, listening to this album, I had this vision of the guys on Event Horizon going into that sphere. Ah, uh, yes. Very and, Event Horizon. Yeah, and this is, this is like what they must have heard when they went in that sphere. That's all I can imagine this could be. Um, I mean, the part five stood out for me. Um, the way the vocals are sort of buried in the mix. Going back to something you said earlier, Jeff, about how the vocals are sort of melded in with actual composition of the music. Yes. Yep. Um, but for me, as, as, as the album then progresses, you, you kind of settle into it, into this sort of other dimension. Uh, and just you're in for the ride, and it becomes almost trance like for me. And then it finishes in probably, probably the most disturbing, twisting, contorting, tortured tracks that he's ever produced for me. Um, I agree. I mean, the title means dead in French. And, and what I think you said, Kevin, it stands for metamorphosis of realistic theories. Um, <laughs> it's so convoluted, so convoluted, it's so dense, bleak, it's unforgiven. Um, I think it's been turned black hole metal. <laughs> I think that's quite appropriate, actually. Um, I mean, it's funny, I, I was reading a quote from him. Um, where, like I said earlier, he doesn't consider this album, the music in this album, the metal at all. But he said about Mort itself that the total end of all and the real beginning of all were the educations, the past, the laws, the thoughts, us, our flesh, the concerns about all and nothing were totally obsolete. And Mort is a pure materialization of the unlimited imagination. And that's how Finn's Hall sees this album. And mm. it's hard to disagree. Um, interestingly, he says that, uh, and Jeff, this will probably mean more to you than it did to me, but everything is played on a fretless or touch guitar. So he said that the, ah. the strings are softer. So yeah. he means it's less aggressive and the sounds more ethereal. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense now that you told me that. I didn't. I wasn't aware of that. How about that? That's interesting. Well, so if, if we go back and, and, and look at the, um, we were talking about his influences and where this is all coming from at this time. He, he's quoting people like Karl Heinz Stockhausen, yeah, um, and people like um, Gerard Greasy from France. I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah, and they right. they were developing this yeah. thing in the 20th century called spectral music. Yeah. And it's about using mathematical analysis to inform the composition. Yeah. So this this guy is going in very deep here. It's like yeah, deeper he than is. I could ever. That's, that's fucking <laughs> super deep. That's way deeper than I'd ever want to think about my music being. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, I to me, this is. Rudolph Snore's Dark Ambient album. But it's Dark Ambient with a twist, as usual. And the twist is there is some, there's a lot of, rather than doing like a, you know, a, a fucking cannibal corpse butchered at birth thing or, or doing a, um, uh, uh, what's the name of that band I can't stand? Fuck. Um, the one with all the horror samples. Mortician. 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 Yeah, we're doing a Mortician album where, you know, 80% of their music is actually samples from music, and then it's a couple crushing riffs and some... Now, and drum what he did, Yeah, what he did was he made the horror much more palpable. And like you said, Event Horizon, it really does elicit that. Um, some kind of murky Cthulhuian... And I think this album has a lot, a lot in common with Disharmonium, the one that came out in May. There's some similarities here. Disharmonium's a little more listenable, maybe, perhaps, maybe just a little, a little bit more melody in there. But it's dark, it's twisted. 
when you're in there, it feels like the walls are moving around you. It feels like people are watching from behind the walls and looking at you and they're reaching out and they're, you know, how in the old days in, in this eighties horror movies, they, they put like that plastic stuff and the person would come through the roof at you. And it was like, I think that was in the frighteners or something like that. It feels like that's what you're going to see. If you go deep into this album, I had not listened to this album in a long time. I thought it was another one. Like, to be honest with you, I thought it was another one. Like, um, um, uh, mystical, uh, yeah, mystical beast, but it's not like that at all. It's oh. dark, spectral, ambient, horrific in a in a psychological sort of way, not in a jump scare way. It's more, uh, it's more in here because you hear things like in the. I think it's in the first or second track. You hear, and I'll box it here. Let me read my notes. They're they're pretty brief on this one. Um, says. Opens very in, uh, very ambient and twisted as fuck, but barely audible. Opens very industrial ambient and twisted as hell, with barely audible voices and haunting sound effects. Laughter. Did you hear the laughter in that one track? I think it's the first track. It might be the second. There's yeah. a laugh that, that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you barely hear it, but you hear it if you listen. And when you're hearing, you're like. Okay, that just creeped me the fuck out. Like parts of me just curled up and ran up inside of me. So sorry to your wife, but <laughs> but that's the truth. That's how it that's how it felt. It was like, man, that like got me in in the naughty bits there. I felt that like that freaked me out a little bit, you know. So uh real quick, I'll wrap up on that. Track eight. No, no, wait. I'm sorry. Oh, once again, laughter, droning out of tune, chords, bass notes that are warbled and warped, so fucking evil sounding. It's like he slowed the tape machine down as he got further into the song. Two is an ambient drone, more of the same as track one, which I dig. Track eight, warped, angular, bizarro, stripped down nightmare. It's a little too long and too weird, so it overstays its uh, welcome, but I really like that track. I really dig the weirdness on this one. Uh, most of it really works. Some of it doesn't, but most of it is. It's a uniquely weird listening experience. Does that mean I'd listen to it a lot? Would it be a go-to Blue House word for me? No. Would it mean, would this be the one I would tell people to go check out? Probably not. I, I don't think this would be a good starting place. I think you got to take in a lot more of the BAN Cosmos before you're ready to, because I'll tell you what, it reminded me a little, little bit of, just a little with some portal some of the the very little portal that i do like there's a couple tracks by portal i do like there's a song called um it's called curtain curtain Kirk. and yeah and it's on vex from 2013 man dude that is a disturbing video you got to watch the video with it on youtube it's there disturbing video terrifying video terrifying song like that song is really that's the best portal has to offer for me. And that's what a lot of this album reminds me of. Um, but the one thing that he's not doing is he's not doing the, you know, the tremolo picking on the eight strings with all the sweeping and weird stuff. He doesn't do any of that. It's, um, you know, I, I hear bits of Peter and I don't know how into, I said this to Kellen earlier, but I don't know how into dark ambient you might be, but I hear bits of atrium carceri on here. I hear bits of call, C A U L, C A U L. I hear bits of City's Last Broadcast. I hear uh, quite a bit of Brian Lustmord or Lustmord. That's what I hear in this. So, in, is it new? No, but is it is it really unique the way he's melded it with his vision of Blue House North? Yeah. So I really like this one, man. This one kind of went way up in my. Well, than I expect them to. I'd give this a solid. Yeah, I'd give this a solid. Probably a solid eight. Do you know something? It's. It's not. It wasn't an album I returned to that often. Mm -hmm. And, but every time I listen to this album, I have the same reaction at the end of it. I just sit there in silence for a minute or two, going, "What have I just been through?" Yeah. But. And, and even though I've, I listened to it maybe three times in the last week, 
and it's, it's the same reaction every time. Even though I've listened to it before and I know what to expect, I'm just sitting there at the end of it. And when you were talking about some of the songs maybe being a bit too long, I don't experience that with this album at all. I just get lost in it. And I'm just... Yeah, I, I do too. I, I don't really... I don't think there's many long ones on this one, is there? Oh. You guys have the track listing there? Uh, yeah, I can look it up quick, but I, I don't think there are. Yeah, I was thinking so, they um, were all in this. I, I was thinking the longest one was like seven and a half, maybe eight. Yeah, right. But I think to your Peter's point, though, like, do you really listen to this record for individual songs? No, I, it's a feel, right. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. Yeah, yeah. like, I, and even your, Val said, it's it's one piece. It's just broken into eight parts. Yeah, there you go. That makes sense. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, this could be. Uh, this could very well be like you know, Lust Mords, um, where the black stars hang, or uh, you know, trying to think of the other really big one that he did. Um, Juggernaut is like that. Zotro, Zo, Zotrope, how do you say that word? Zotrope is like that, and uh, you know, Heresy is the big one. This reminds me of Heresy. Holy shit! And that is probably one. Of, I mean. You want to scare kids at your front door on Halloween, man? Put heresy on and, you know, put the bowl of candy out there and a bunch of spooky lights, man. You won't have many kids come up to that door, I guarantee it. <laughs> I've fallen asleep with that fucking album on it. It's literally, I've woken up sweating and, like, freaking out. Like, why did I do that? That was not a good idea. So, go ahead, Cal. I was going to say, you seem like the person who did that at some point. Like, that sounds like a very, like, from experience. Jeff has I put have, that on. Yeah. Okay. I have done that, yeah. I, I, may, I may take you up on that offer here this Halloween. Um, yeah, so for me, <laughs> I, I, I have next uh, to the album title in my notes, you're just written, holy shit. Like, I can only, I can only imagine um, you just, so this is your first official release with Candlelight. And they're like, we're, we're going to bring Blue Al Snort in and like okay, here's my first release with you and brings this in and gives it to the whatever record label I can only imagine what their first impression was of it um yeah that's that's a really good that's a really good point <laughs> um like how happy were they when this when they right like this? you come off of you know I, I i don't i don't know like i could be they could have been absolutely thrilled but it is a we want to call it like an invertebrate sort of animal that, oh yeah, um, good word, good word. I like I like Peter your description of you know falling in this record, like falling into the abyss, because you're listening to it, and I keep on searching right in like that part of your head that wants to identify like clearly certain parts of a record or instrumentally what's happening, and in my head I'm sort of looking to grab onto something. And it just feels like whatever I reach for starts to dissolve in my hand. Um, oh man! And it is it is so strange. Uh, and there are like getting lost in the record. I think that's a great way of putting it. Um, it's a something that you sort of survive the gauntlet. You don't necessarily like, listen for a certain right. Like I need to get to, it's going to come on, and I'm going to go through this experience. And I need to remain whole by the end of it. And that's the goal of this listening, right? Yeah, like, very well put. Very well put. Um, now, I, I just want to say, I read interviews talk, you know, I think, um, talk about this record. And Jeff and I were talking about it prior. Um, it, it came at some degree of personal cost. Um, and he's he's been pretty open and explicit about this, that like, the place he was writing from, the inspiration that sort of found him in this writing process, it was not like a place that he could have shared with anyone. So I think it was selfishly written in that regard. Um, it's always been a lot to, to some degree, like his project, um, his vision. But I don't know in this hypothetical scenario where he's sharing now Ghost is a member of the band. Um, he's, you know, he's sharing this space to some degree. But when he's talked about writing this, record how much a it was like a, a sort of he endured it i guess is a good way to phrase it um there was some level of like attrition that he survived in the course of writing it because of the toll that it took on him psychologically and emotionally wow um 
So, but but that completely, you hear this record and that makes all the sense in the world, right? It like does. You, could, yeah. you could understand someone suffering in order to sort of convey this. Um, it, it's an amazing record uh, in in that regard. Um, so I, I, I absolutely, you know, love it, but it's not something that I ever approach easily, which is, I thought, why you would sort of where Portal would make sense. It's like, you know, you brace yourself as soon as you hit play because this is going to, you know, it's going to be something that you have to commit to. Yeah. Because if, cause if yeah. it's going to be wallpaper playing in the background, it's going to be a rough wallpaper, right? Like, it's, yeah. it's difficult. It's, it's not just, gonna be a pleasant. It's not gonna be yeah, a pleasant yeah, experience. Right. Yeah, I, I so, kind of liken this to. I kind of liken this album a little bit to sort of like a oral nightmare, that there's just there's a lot of. There's a lot of stress and tension and anguish in all of the, pieces and moving parts, but yet, it flows pretty good. It doesn't. It doesn't. You know, like you said, you don't go into it looking for specific. Oh, there's that riff in track four, or there, there's that, those two riffs and that one scream on track seven or whatever. It's not like that. It's not that kind of an album. It's, again, I think it's what only about thirty eight minutes. Am I wrong on that? I think it's like 40, 40, minutes? 40 minutes long. Forty minutes. Forty yeah. forty seven minutes. I'm sorry. Well, it's forty seven, so it's a little longer than I thought. Um, but it's kind of one of those things where, you strap in, you you step back, and you let it wash over you and let the chips fall where, where they may. I was pleasantly surprised by this one because I'd forgotten. I don't think I had a really good first Im uh, impression of it way back. I don't think I remembered what my impression was it when I first listened to it, like maybe six, seven years ago. I didn't grab it, so I must not have been into it at, as into it at the time, maybe. But now, after listening to it again, now I'm like, man, I really this one I need to have. This is yeah. one that yes, I'm not going to pick it up. It's not going to be an every week listen. Might not be in every six month listener, but when it does, when the mood strikes me and I put it on, the impact's going to be hard. Right. It's going to be intense. Yeah. I, I think, like I, like I said earlier, I didn't come up with a ranking system or a scoring system when I was listening to these albums. Um, and because I'm not so familiar with the 777 trilogy, right. I, I suppose once I hear everything, maybe I can start. Put them in some kind of rank. No, but for me, it's... I, I didn't. I wasn't trying to. I was just kind of giving you guys a feel for where I came from yeah. on these, and you know, your mileage may vary a little bit. You know, I mean, I, 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 I the only one I really kind of shit on a little bit was Mystical, just because it wasn't to my taste. The others were all generally seven or eight or whatever. This one here is real high up. It's not the highest one we're going to talk about. That one's coming up, but uh, it. This one was. I would say this one was the surprise in the litter. This yeah. was the one that I was like, damn, that is really fucking. There's something about this album that's pretty goddamn cool. Yeah. But it's not for everybody. I will tell you, there's no way I'd say, hey, why don't you listen to Mort the very first time? They're, they'd never go back to it. Well, sure. I, I would say that we were talking about earlier if someone said, right, I want to get into Blood Ice Nord. Where should I start? And obviously, depending on their background, you would direct them to the appropriate album. I think if someone came up to me and said, well, tell me why Blood Ice Nord is so different to any other band, I'd say, right, that's your album. Right. Go listen oh, to that. Man, for sure. Yeah, very good point. Right. All right, well, then we, we both, we all had a pretty favorable favorable opinion on that one. Sure. Uh, I, I, did you say it was, it was Black Hole Metal earlier? Yeah, yeah. That Cause, sounds about right too. Like it sucks everything in and doesn't let anything out. Well, I was thinking because there's that thing um, about falling into a black hole, 
I think it's actually, I think the term is uh, spaghettification, where the gravitational pull on the, on the, where your body is closer to the center or the singularity versus where you're, the rest of your body is like people, as you would fall in and you're like on an atomic level, your body would slowly get stretched based on the gravitational pull closest to the singularity versus what separates it. Mm -hmm. And I just think about that sonically happening to this record. Like, it just being torn slowly sort of apart. Oh, um, wow, that's, that's, amazing. that's pretty fucking trippy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I like that. I like That's pretty cool. Um, Very good. Okay, so I think we can put a, a bow, a pretty gorgeous bow on, on Mort there. Um, a his, a his on. hysterically frightening bow on that one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to move here. To um, Odinist. So uh, comes around, I believe, in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, another candlelight release. And we all, I will let uh, Peter, if you want to jump to this one, give your thoughts on Odinist. Yeah, so. Um listen to this after you know like listen chronologically and you're coming out of the warp twisted black hole that is mort um so this felt like a re-emergence from that abyss i suppose um this is where there's some kind of semblance of form and song structures starting to, re to return to 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 blood ice nord um and i suppose this is where He's the closest he's been to writing songs since probably the first two, I think. Um, there's a lot more focals than it was in Mort. I suppose that was something I didn't really touch upon, was that Mort is kind of near enough devoid of vocals, really. Um, but even saying that, that's, there's, not, there's not many vocals in this, in this album. The melody is starting to return. I think, for me, the title track is my favorite Mine on this too. one um and that's a mi mi mystic absolute i mean there's such a tension in those riffs that's that's why i was hearing from that one um yeah it's starting to like i said it's starting to return to sort of conventional it's like i suppose that still helps down here earlier about this journey he's on this is him re emerging out of it and has he is he different to what he was before, even in through the work that trans which transforms got a mort? Is he a different person, or is he seeking a return to what he was before, and that's going to to follow up in the next album? So, yeah, it's it's. I still I think my opinion on this in the overall um, scarf of what I know probably isn't one of my favorite because it's not it's not much variation I think as well kind of like the the, the musical beast like I said the title track does stand out for me that, that melody in it. Um, and that's something that's, that's probably my favorite track on the album actually so okay uh, Jeff any thoughts here like you the Odinist is probably my favorite track there's one other track there uh, what was it called Cycle of Cycles towards the bat. I think it's the last yeah. track, the next to the last track. That's actually a really cool track right there. There's a lot of cool guitar work going on in that. You know, for me, it's, this starts off kind of warped and oppressive and weird like Mortbit, Mortbit. But as you say, the vocals are more prominent here. A lot of shrieks and croaks and all that kind of good stuff. Grinding into emptiness, I use that term. This album has a bit of a a bit of the same tempo thing that drags on it for a little bit for me. All the songs sort of blend into one. They, he's this album more than any other album is, other than maybe Mystical Beast. I noticed the tempo was kind of mid tempo. Everything was mid tempo. Nothing, nothing seemed to be. There wasn't anything super fast or anything super slow. Um, so this one was the last one I listened to. It was one I'd forgotten as I sit telling them like, oh shit. 
I forgot to listen to that one. I missed that. Completely. And I found a full stream of it, and I went back and, and ripped through it, and it didn't leave much of an impression on me. So I'm going to give that a five and a half or a six out of ten, simply because I think I need more time with it. I think it could be a decent album, but I don't see it achieving like godlike status with me. Um, it's not. It's not unique and frightening and bizarre like Fort is, and it's not what we're about to talk about with the next album that's mind blowing. And it's and, and and in between there, and it's not honestly as good in my opinion. It doesn't sound as good as War uh, the God one. Work with Transforms God. Yes, yeah. Work with Transforms God. Damn. Um, it, it doesn't have, I think, as much melody as that album or as variety as that album. So, and of course, it's very different from the first two. It's not anything like those. So, I think it's, it's a decent album. It's probably one I will want to have in the collection. But again, that's that's a used bin pickup for me or used CD on eBay for four ninety nine dollars shipping that, that I'll go for. You know, those, when I'm a, you know, I like to be a completist too on certain bands and this is certainly one that i've always thought i was going to complete it some way shape or form but i'm not buying brand new albums and brand new cds of certain ones that i know i'm not going to listen to so that's my take on it Cal, what you got i mean i'm pretty much in agreement with you this is very much a transition album for me um you when what but even makes in some ways like um, Mystical Beast was a transition into something new. I think he's trying to steer the ship in somewhere out of Mort, right? And this he lands on Odin. I think to, to Peter's narrative, right, of like an individual trying to understand himself and, you know, relay that through their art, um, it, that's an interesting way to look at it um, because it, it has a bit more, I guess, uh, relevance to me. Because sonically, I, I'm, I had a difficult time really engaging with this record. Um, it just, there are other, rec other albums that do elements of this in a stronger capacity. Um, then, you know, do this better. If you wanted something that does the, like, more traditional black metal, you have better releases. If you want something that does a bit more of the industrial, you have better releases. You just came out of the most experimental, forward-thinking record in the catalog. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, and it, it doesn't really achieve um, or speak to those qualities. I don't think. I think it goes back to, I think, your point about, you know, We've talked about he he's planned everything out, and he's come out of Mort, and he can't go. I don't think he, he knows he can't go straight from Mort to um, MV two. Well, so the other thing is knows, too. The other, is, the other, but the other thing is too, and this is what you may have touched on, Kellen. Maybe the guys at Candlelight went, uh, "Dude, can you give us something a little more saleable? Because that was really <laughs> fucked up, man. Like we love it. Yeah. It's twisted. It's fucking weird, but." Can you give us something a little more blue dust nordy? <laughs> you know what I mean? No, and I, I think that's what happened. Well, because I know he did mention the one of the things he loved about moving to, and we'll talk about this in part two of the series of the deep dive, um, is how freeing it was to move to Debbie Mirmorti. That yeah, they really were like, you do you. You do We're not you going to yeah. steer yeah. you in a direction or limit you artistically. A true artist and, label as opposed to a business. Right. Like he just And has I bet you that's some of it. I bet you that's some of it because think about it, Kellen. Think about think about who's been on Candlelight. You have Opeth who went to Great Big Heights. You have Emperor who went on to Great Big Giant Heights. 
Who else? I know there's got to be others. Who else is on candlelight? I mean, the great old ones, you got, um, I mean, there's a lot of, I'm not right. like you guys, I'm not a, a label memorizer, dude, but there was a lot of bands on, on there that have gone on to really great heights. And right. I'm sure also, I'm wondering if there was any time along his tenure there that they said, hey, what's the chances we put together a live touring band so we can, you know, who knows? Maybe that came up and he went, oh, fuck no, I'm out of here. I don't want to tour. You know, I mean, we don't know unless he does an interview on it. Who knows? I'll tell you, this is a guy that I would love to fucking interview, but I would feel probably too stupid to interview. Yeah, I think you and every metal journalist would probably love to get the opportunity. <laughs> oh, man, I would love, but I think I'd, I think I'd be too... Honestly, I just don't think I'd be smart enough to talk to the guy on his level, man. You know, yeah. who knows? Um, but well, I, I, I mean, I read with him that uh, that that two page spread, that one in Terrorizer, which is the, the longest one I can find. That is, um, that's James Harry Henscliffe, who wrote for Terrorizer for years. He's the one who starts mentioning all these French. 20th century composers, and that just seems to trigger something in Finn's well. He starts opening up and talking away about where he's coming from, where oh. all the other interviews I've seen, he, he barely says much. It's it's mainly like the narrative of the interviewer, and then there's a few quotes here and there, and that's it. He may be very, he may be, he may be one of those guys, kind of guys that's not a big talker, he, uh, the opposite of me. You know, I mean, somebody that is really reserved, thinks about every answer thinks very decidedly and measuredly about what they're going to say as opposed to just blurting out their gut feelings or whatever. Uh, I would I would think he would be that kind of guy because he seems like a deep thinker to me with all his conceptual stuff, you know. Okay, so here's a moment because Peter and I were talking about this um, in the lead up. So here we are, we're in 2007. And how different he chose to pursue he had all the opportunity in the world to put himself out there and be media friendly to put together a, like he could have gone that route. This is an era in black metal, right? Like, so I'm at an age where during the two thousands, all the controversy that had made black metal a phenomena now I think is in pretty broad circulation. Right. And that controversy really galvanized a whole lot of interest and ex the genre exploded in the 2000s in terms yeah, of it did, yep. the fan base. Um, oh, yeah. Well, and, the, and, the church, the church burning and the fucking Euronymous thing. And right. Right. Even guys like, even guys like me who thought it was fucking silly was like, eh, you know, maybe I'll pick that book up and read about it. You know, I, and I did. Um, and when Peter made the point, like it has always been about the music. Um, yeah. And if, if, he, if that meant like, you know, I don't I don't want to be, you know, constantly in the media. I don't care about how necessarily popular I am or successful I am. I'm going to sort of stay true to how I think I should operate and how a Blue Dows Nord should be presented. Um, and, it is just, and in this era, I think that's important to contextualize that. That he yeah, is yeah, yeah. He's, he had, you know, not only the fame but he had arrived during an era of black metal that had was more visible and successful financially than ever. Um, yeah. And he went in the I mean, office. Imagine, imagine that unless you know this guy through somebody that knows him in France or in the scene, let's say you could walk by this guy a hundred times and not have any clue who he was. Now, sure. could you do that with, could you do that with Varg? No, you'd recognize him. Could you do that with even Ishan? No, you'd recognize him and you'd be like, oh, dude, this guy, you know, or, or, you know, Abbott or something like that. All these kind of household names, these characters, you know, and many of them aren't. I mean, some of them are like Samoth never was big into the, the limelight stuff, but I would know who he is. You know what I mean? But it's like if you went to a metal festival and if somebody would walk up to you and say, dude, do you know who that is? That's his involved. I'd be like, oh, okay, well, I know who that is. But I bet you, you walked up to a giant, if you went to a giant, like, Bakken or one of those metal festivals, and you walked up to somebody and said, hey, what's that dude over there? That's Vinsval. 
I bet you 85% would be like, who? Yeah. Who? They wouldn't know who he is. Let's be honest. They may know who that's Nord, but I guarantee you they don't really know who he is. Yeah. And, you I, know, as I've said, I've seen one picture of him, and I'm not sure it's really a picture of him. And that video, which I'll look for here at the end, but I, I you know, I, yeah, he's a, he's a very interesting character. And like you said, during that period of time when he had all the opportunity in the world to become one of those household names in the metal community or be on Krang or be in all the, the, the mags and stuff, he actually chose not to do that. Not because he was being, oh, I'm so cult. You know, he didn't pull that shit. He wasn't like, I'm so cult and all I do is live in a cave that has seeping walls of moss and I, you know, I drink virgin's blood at night and I, you know, I pull corpses out of, you know, he's not that guy either. He's just a dude that likes to read really heady stuff and write difficult, interesting music. And most people in music have no idea about him at all. Yeah. And, and he's not, he's not one of these ones who you see in black metal and but I went to see uh, Megla recently, you know, mm-hmm. who come on stage with the black black coat covering on their face face covering yeah and they got their hoodies but five minutes earlier they're doing sound check with like all this um so it's almost like you know five on. minutes earlier they're over at the bar chugging beers <laughs> well to be fair when i went to see uh imperial triumphant the other night they they were doing the same so and then they came back on stage with all oh. their outfits oh um, they did okay yeah but um it's almost like we want to be anonymous, but we're out in front of you on stage. He's done it properly. He's not entertained any of that. And you're saying yeah. about the scene. He, he did say in his earlier, the earliest interviews I can find from around the early 2000s, he said he was in the tape trading scene. Early say it again, on, he wasn't what? He was into the tape trading scene. Right, right, right. And black metal back in 93, 94, but then he got out of it. And he decided he didn't want to be part of any scene at all. And he said he didn't, he, he wanted uh, Blood Eyes Sword. I wrote down a quote. He said, It's a faceless entity, dehumanized and without ego. So that's where he's come from. And he stuck to it all these years. So that's all. Yeah. yeah, I think, you know, I think for him, it's it's an artistic vision that he doesn't want to get caught up in as far as. I mean, let's be honest, though. He, there's a little bit of getting caught up in it, though, because his product is way more available now than it ever was before. And, you know, he's doing the multiple... Like, I remember when Hallucinogen came out, I was going to jump all over the first variant because it was so fucking cool looking. But, it, you know, because it was shipping from from France, it was like, I don't know, like 40 It was like $50 for a double L. Uh, it was more than that. 55. So I held off and man, that, that thing was sold out. 350 copies was sold out in an hour. I would imagine most of the variants now are the, the really hard to find ones are sold out pretty easily, but they keep pumping more variants out. So he's not, he's, he's at least shrewd in that respect that it's like people want your stuff. So let's figure out a way to keep putting it out there without totally compromising it, you know, and saying, well, we made a hundred, but we got to make 300 now. Let's make a different variant, you know, and that's kind of feeding the collector item thing. But, yeah, I mean, yeah, he's a unique cat. I, like I said, I, like you said, Kellen, I'm sure most people that have any clue who he is would be like, oh, yeah, let me talk to that dude. But I would be honestly afraid I'd come off looking like a dumbass. I'm like, oh, uh, sorry, man, you watched that uh, You watched that Ravens game the other day? <laughs> are, you in, are you in the Tennessee right. Titans? <laughs> okay. Yeah, are you a uh, Tennessee Titans fan? We can <laughs> hang out. If not, <laughs> okay. Well, right, that leads last one, last record here, and it's a, a great one to end on. Oh man, um, so good. Two thousand and nine, Memoria Vetusta to Dialogue with the Stars. Um, this is the last release that uh, on Candlelight. So, um. If there was any pressure for them to get a classic black metal record out of Lute Ausnor before he left, um, he gave it to him. I, I, I will, you know, hold off on my um, thoughts on this record here, but uh, 
I'm going to give it here. Peter, if you want to jump in and um, talk about Dialogue with the Stars. Yeah, so it's, it's a few notes anyway, but it's pretty obvious that this was a return to more, like you said, I don't know if it's conventional black metal, but it's closer to um, black metal than it had been for the last, what, nine years or whatever. Um, but I, I did write down here, a uh, return of melodies with loads of estimation marks. So, and what melodies they are like, I mean, it's absolutely sublime the whole way through. Um, they're just the way they, they're constantly intertwining amongst the riffs and the songs as they go along. So it's not, you have like, say a guitar solo, but it's a separate guitar solo that lasts 30 seconds on a particular section of the song. It just weaves itself the whole way through and becomes part of the song. It's so, it's so important. Um, yeah, nearly, nearly everything um, down here um, revolves around the melodies. But one thing I kind of focused on just for this dive is the, I know we don't have any lyrics, but it's the song titles. And he seems to be getting into a lot of Buddhist meditation techniques. Um, so that song, The Alcove of Angels, uh, Fipasama, um, which is a, a Buddhist practice for meditation. It's all to do with like a, a sort of like a mental pra practical technique to achieve liberation. Um, and then you move it's into... Very, it's a very esoteric, there's a lot of very cosmic and esoteric titles on this, this album. And just the whole, you know, it started out with Fathers of Icy Age, but now we moved into Dialogue with Stars. Just that title alone, Dialogue with Stars, is... Oh, yeah. pretty fucking mind blowing. Yeah, so um, you know he has tran translucent body of her Sutta Anas Panasati. If I'm you pronounce that correctly, and again that's another Buddhist te technique. It's a breathing technique for mindfulness and med meditation. So, oh, wow. I mean, the, the more I was reading in this, it was like the Fipa San Sana Fipa Sana. I don't know if I'm pronouncing these things right. Yeah. Is it the, is a medita meditation technique that is kind of seen as different to transcendental meditation? So um, one is trying to escape through to another sort of realm of consciousness, where this vipassana is about internal meditation techniques with your brain to try and find out what could be wrong with you, so that they can then solve it. So I and I. I I know this is a bit of a tangent, but I'm trying to sort of understand where his mind is when he's making this record. Why has he come back to bring in sort of these melodies back? How does this link to the first part of the MV trilogy, and which seemed to be about reconnecting to the ancient times? But is this him then moving on to see, well, what's next in the journey? Where do, where do I go next? Again, that story arc I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, just back to, to the music, I noted down acceptance. Um, it kind of starts off closer to traditional black metal fur. It's fast, fierce, scathing guitars. But then it hits this clean break midway through the song. And it just brings in those melodic guitar leads again. And it's just, for me, that's the, the defining thing about this album, the melodies. Um, and they can't get enough of them. And there's kind of Middle Eastern sort of vibe towards the end of that song. Yeah, like, there is. It reminds me a wee bit of Melikish. No. You're writing sort of scales. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's definitely so, uh, some Arabic Arabic scales in there, yeah. Yeah. Um, let me see. I've quite a few notes written down here. <laughs> <for this laughs> one. It's worthy um, of them. Oh, yeah, definitely. But again, I'm, I'm sort of like the, the form of sphere, like, again, it's the same kind of idea. It's this fast, aggressive start, blasting drums. Then you hit with a melodic guitar part, which is just, just transcendental for me. And I, I don't know if this is to do with the whole meditation aspect. He's going for in the song titles, and God knows what he's singing about. Um, but yeah, I, I wrote an album of meditation after a run of albums that felt transcendental. Now he wants to kind of look inside um, for the next part of the journey. <laughs> No, that's that's good. That's a good observation. Yeah. Can I can I ask you a quick question, Peter? 
Um, did, is that just research that you did for this album, or do you are do you actually practice any Buddhism? Well, I, I don't personally, but well, my wife does. Okay. So we have Buddhas all outside our house. Okay. Um, she would do things like Reiki, and um, the, she does quite a lot of meditation. I, I would do quite a bit of mindfulness, and I think. I, uh, I just because it seemed you seemed so, so familiar with it. I was I was curious if you actually had some kind of knowledge, prior well, knowledge or background. Slight, slight background, but from listening to the albums during the week um, and today as well, it's because I told you already, I asked you earlier, was this album going to be on the list? Because I can't find my CD copy of all the other CDs sitting here, but I'm sure it's in amongst that wall I have um, somewhere. But. <laughs> um, and I was the just daunting, trying to look for lyrics, daunting, lyrics for this one. Yeah. The daunting wall. The daunting wall to find anything on. Yours is actually worse than mine. At least mine is in is in boxes. So if I pull them out, I only got to go. You, you literally got to pull out things Jenga style to hope you find the, the right thing. Oh, it's a real pain. A real pain, Tyler. You told okay. your wife you need. You told your wife in your new house you need a whole room for all your CDs, right? Do you want me to say well, that a little louder what, for you, Peter? <laughs> it's just way to bed, but um, yeah, when we bought this house, it had that spare room to put them in, but it was far too small. Uh, clearly. Okay. And it's, go ahead, Kel. Well, Jeff, do you want to jump in here? Um, sure, sure. Yeah, so uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts on Dialogue with the Stars? Okay, Dialogue is, without question, my second favorite album. Um by Blue Dots Lord. And that's that's saying a lot because I really, really like a lot of albums. You know, as I said, Cosmosophy is my number one. Uh, I really loved uh, I have I really loved uh, what's the other one? Um, Saturnian poetry. I love a loose I love the new one. I like both the other uh, seven seven sevens. But this album is special, man. Holy shit. Oh, my God. Um, I had listened to it in a while, and I put it on about 2 o'clock today. No, noon, I guess, was when I got up. And I listened to it, and I just was like, my mouth was like gobsmacked. I was like, this fucking album is just so good. Um, again, this is a top three to five Blue Dots Nords, probably my second or third. The opening set of... of almost ascendant sounding keyboards you're just some he's just playing some chords on the on the synthesizer but it sounds like you're ascending somewhere through through that little musical passage like something is being exposed to you and open to only you to see and hear the melodies and guitars on, and the atmosphere on the sound are just breathtaking the epic grandness of tracks like disciples liberation has to be heard to believe meditant Formless sphere and antithesis of flesh are just killer epic songs. You have to hear them to understand how good they are. The interludes are super cool and don't go on too long and link up with their sister tracks well. Often, um, no, often, Vinsvog can overstay his welcome on certain things, but not on this album, especially with the longer songs. Sometimes he has a habit of going on an extra minute or two too long but not on this this album i i think there's what four or five songs that are in the eight to ten minute range right Is that yeah right and then there's maybe what three or four like there's three or four interlude songs and then the last song is kind of like about a five minute or four minute track yeah i think the title track the meditant dialogue with the stars is the longest yeah that's like 10 I something think it's around 10 minutes or so yeah um Let's see. Often, oh, these are perfectly fleshed out songs that need the space to breathe, to experience the part. Uh, oh, for example, the, the part on Formless Sphere, where it all gets super proggy and the synths sound very rush like that song, Formless Sphere sounds like a rush song to me. Um, the repetitive giant chords and melodies, harmony leads are so damn killer. Meditance, the, the monster epic track that could be a rush, Fates Warning, slash, slash, dream theater prog level song but it still maintains its blackened edges so it's not a full-on wank fest of any sort none of the none of these songs are wank fest 
Uh, you know, it's not like you got a seven minute guitar solo on any of these. Uh, let's see what else I got here. And this album has quite a bit of, of Vince Vall lead work on it that is not always his trademark. He doesn't blow a lot of leads into his music. My only complaint is the drumming seems sort of rudimentary at times. And I can't really tell on this one if it's a drum machine or not, but it sounds like it could be a real drummer. If so, it's a little bit lazy on the time sometimes, seems to me. That may just be my, you know, the, the stream I was listening to. Um, let's see. Here we go. My only tiny grape about the album, Antithist is the weakest epic track, but it's still a killer track. And the final track, what's the final track called? Elevation. Elevation. Uh, well, there you go. What did I say in the opening chords? It feels like you're being elevated somewhere or moving somewhere. The last track's Elevation. Angelic reaching for the sky cascades into your head. So good. This is a 9.75. Only the drumming kind of puts me off a tiny bit, and it's very little. It's a very minor gripe. The production is great. The synth sounds are great. The guitar sound is massive, but yet still on point it's metal but it's not metal it's prog but it's not prog it's just an amazing fucking album and like i said probably my number two and now on any given day it could it could push cosmosophy for number one it's just such a beautiful album and i would say that if i was just getting to meet somebody this would be either my second or first album to suggest to them to be checked out yeah, um, especially like if you're coming from more traditional black metal space, that makes. Um, uh, agree with everything said. Um, I some records you listen to, and you know within the first couple of notes, um, you're completely you know consumed by the record. Like I you know. there's like, records that I feel that way about. Um, yeah, you, and, you're right. You, you just know on those first couple of notes, you know, you're like, man, this is going to fucking be incredible. And you just know it. And this album does just that to me, I think. I uh, So in 2009, I was getting ready to leave the States to uh, live in South Korea. And I had to go up to actually the to uh, Seattle. I was originally living in Oregon. I had to go up to Seattle to get just uh, some visa stuff taken care of. And I went out with my dad and this would have been in uh, November of 2009. So if you know anything about the Pacific Northwest and what it's like in November, I, I imagine it's not too much different from what it's like in Ireland. Um, but really? it, <laughs> um, cold, 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 rainy and cold, snowy and, and overcast. But um, you you ride essentially to get up from where I live in Eugene to Seattle. It's just a straight shot off the West coast. Um, and on I five. And I remember driving and it was, you know, at this point in the year by like six o'clock or so it's dark. Um, and it was, you know, dark, rainy at night. Um, but there were like clouds were sort of like, you could still see, you know, whatever from the road, still see some stars, whatever. Anyway, it's about like a eight hour drive and this record was playing and I was eternally linked to that sort of memory um, with this record um, because it, it is it's that personal um, for me. It, it From the, those first few notes, I remember that time period in my life. I remember hearing it when it first came out. I read a review saying the solo in the meditant um, has me... Wow. Uh, Throwing my fists while doing my dishes in the kitchen, like. It, it, it has that kind of 
like in, enjoyment, enthusiasm um, that you don't necessarily get from a black metal record, but the guitar work. Like I, I agree with your sentiment, Jeff. That it's um, the the drums are not the highlight here, right? The no, they're not. Is otherworldly. Uh, it's otherworldly, and the atmospheres, Kellen, that the, oh. that those guitar notes evoke. It's evocative. That's the word. It's so evocative. Yeah, you look at those pictures and you're like, you feel like you're there. Like you're hanging in those clouds or you're you're soaring above those clouds looking down. And I mean, you, that's really cool. You had that experience that was such a visceral sort of thing. Like, man, I'm, you know, I'm driving and I could almost see maybe I'm wrong here, but I could see if that was me, I probably would have listened to that album over and over and over like four or five times yeah. because it just would have not. I wouldn't have wanted it, that feeling to go away, you know, Um. And I, so, so here's an important note. This is 2009. We get part two. It has been, what, 13 years um, since part one. And I think that's really interesting um, because Ooh. over all those 13 years, think of all the different records we've talked about during the course of this stream, all the different ways that he's sort of woven in and out of different sounds only to come 13 years later to kind of re-experience or re-explore this, this sound, um, which is probably well, why there is. And, and I would say potentially if you, if you stack these two albums up side by side, this one and father of the icy age, they're, they're somewhat different records. I don't really hear the same. I, I get that there's, I get that there's a, a thread going through it, maybe from a storytelling vantage point, but sound wise, I don't hear the same the same song or the same sound. You get what I mean? I think this the second version is such a more it's so much more matured. Realized. Mm -hmm. That's what I guess I'm getting at. Is like yep, yep. from the themes, right? I think you get a little bit like a that we talked about with Icy Age, where you have this part of traditional sort of pagan, almost black metal that is he's fusing a cosmos sort of identity, right? We get a glimpse in it in 2000 and, and I'm sorry, in 1996, but 13 years later, he has recrafted that he has matured that he has elevated that sound to, to your point, Jeff, this is a world of a, a brand new page that has he's introduced with this record um, it's a it just, um it's a much more elevated version of that ban sound and right. i think i think that you know you can't you know a lot of people especially metal people some metal people let's put it that way get all fucking itchy and you know twitchy when they hear the word prog but this the the, the evolution from Father of the Icy Ages to Dialogue is truly a progressive evolution. You know, it's not a yes album. It's not like you suddenly put out Closer to the Edge Part 2 on, on uh, you know, black metal style. It's not that at all. What he's done is he's become a much better songwriter, a much better evoker of feelings with the, the choices of notes that he makes. And it gets honestly it at times it gets better coming up which is hard to do but they this guy keeps raising the bar and how long has he been doing this now 30 years on that but i would say unequivocally of the first era if we want to split this into two eras dialogue with the stars is just almost impossible to beat for me Okay, I would agree there. Um, any last words here? We're kind of wrapping up. So this is an opportunity for anyone who wanted to add anything in or last well, thoughts. I, I had an absence here by the, the EP. Yes. That came right after yeah, the I didn't look, I didn't listen to any EPs, Peter, so I don't, I can't yeah. offer any. Well, th this is the, the only EP from the first year. Okay. So this is the thematic emanation of archetypal multiplicity and it's more or less mainly an industrial dark ambient 
EP. So there's very little metal on it at all. Maybe the first track you might get some metal in it. But for, that was really straight candlelight as well. Um, though this one and Odinist on my CDs have candlelight and appease me as a joint release. Um, but what I just want to note here was from that EP right through to Dialogue with the Stars, it's the same guy doing the cover art, a guy called David, David Cragney, who I looked up Metal Archives and he's done some co cover art for a few other French bands, but his style is very distinctive. And I got these. I, I love that artwork on that album. It's so damn cool, man. Yeah. Um, so I, the only thing I wanted to say relative to this first of all i wanted to hey thank you for doing this both of you guys because the original plan was we were going to do this on gas mask we were going to handle you know i was going to do my usual you know crazy shit and i still did to some degree to a degree i really didn't know if i was going to make it and i can't believe for a second we initially thought about doing all the albums because this would be this would be an eight hour episode six and a half seven hour episode because there's still yeah. Is there eight or nine more? They have albums in there. Plus, and no, we're not doing EPs, but there's about four. Yeah, there's a bunch years. of EPs in there too. Um, so you know, first of all, Kellen, thanks for getting it off the ground and doing yep. it, and kind okay. of undertaking, you know, just arranging it and getting Peter sorted out and everything like that. You know, it's been a, it's been a rough, it's been a rough couple of weeks, and I, I unfortunately don't anticipate it getting a whole lot better. Um, you know, the, the next part of the discography is pretty special to me. It's probably special to all you guys, too. So, but I, I really want to thank you, Kellen, for doing it. I'm looking forward to seeing what you do with it. Um, you know, as far as interjecting things and, you know, wh when we get to it and it's what we're at three hours and 18 now when you post it and it's only an hour and 27 minutes and I'm not in it, then I'll know exactly what you did. <laughs> <laughs> No, but no, I really, I, I think it's been, yeah, it's been so cool to talk to you guys about a band that means a lot to all of us, you know, uh, you know, there's, and I could say probably of all the black metal bands, other than maybe Enslaved and maybe Emperor, this one probably means the most, uh, there's something special about it, and I feel lucky that we, we have that connection and we know that. I gotta be honest with you, I was a little scared coming up against both of you guys, I was thinking, man, they're going to wipe the floor with me. I'm probably not going to know as much as those guys do, but I guess I know a little bit about some of it. So, Yeah, I know. I think um, but when when you mentioned my Instagram post earlier, about me schooling, I was thinking, absolutely not, because I'm going to go back to that point. When you when you first put it to me about doing this deep dive, I was thinking, I'm, I'm not really big into this band, but I probably am. Yeah, I'm you're really. pretty big into this band. I but, mean, I know... But it's there's other guys. That all come in, at, the three of us come from different spaces with this band. We do. We definitely do. No doubt. We came from different angles into it. I think well, whatever we do, part two, it's going to the the initial two albums are going to be relatively new to me. Ah, wow. So, okay. Um, well, that'll be. Interesting I have heard them see. before, but it's been a while. So. Well, it, knowing that you like dialogue with stars as much as I do going to be very shocked if you don't like if you don't really dig like uh, the seven a lot of the seven seven stuff it's similar but different but it's very but it's it's in that wheelhouse yeah but not repeating the wheel the um, only one i have is the final one because my, what's that the only one i have with the trilogy is the final one what a sect no he, he has the last one because of cosmophily yeah. Oh, you do have Cosmosophy. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so the first two I'm not, not familiar with, so yeah. And, fresh from... I mean, Cosmosophy is so damn good, man. That is such yeah. a good. Album. And I mean, so is Saturn. You know, when Saturnian came out, when did that come out, Colin? Was that 14? 2014. Okay. I was kind of surprised. I was like, "Whoa, where did this come from?" Yeah. Because it was like when I had started. I was definitely starting down that road. And that came out, and I was like, wow. And it is so good. That one's very much like dialogue. Um, right. And then, you know, and then, you know, I have not gotten the last two because obviously finances and health and everything like that. But I've listened to 
hallucinogen tons and um you know i don't i know i listened to the harmonium twice i need to kind of go back to it it came out when i was not feeling so good and it's just that's a that's very much a that's very much a cosmosophy mixed with mort album there's definite mortisms on that album oh yeah i stuck it on today after going three up till uh, when i went up to odinist um, and I, I started at about 10, half 10 this morning, and I finished about 4 o'clock. Oh, and shit. Stuck, yeah. Um, doing a couple of week things around the house uh, during, but um, I went back and then stuck on the new one, and it felt like I was listening to, I felt like I was listening to one of those albums again. Different. It's very, it's very mort like, I think, and that's what's. Yeah. But it's a little more, it's a little more palatable, I think. There's definitely more. I, for me, they are the hallucinogen and disharmonium are are pairing. Um, I think they're meant to be listened, and I, I personally like. I I feel that's how often he's writing, like inspiration strikes and consumes. A certain part of him and then he'll exhaust this idea yeah, so, yeah I, I i think you're right like he just shoots his wad big time man. and it's like i'm gonna just i'm gonna nail everything i can in this vein i'm gonna mine it and complete it and then i'll decide what to do with it and if, if i get two or three albums out of it you know so be it um yeah it's this this, this era of blood eyes nord i'm only like i said familiar with the final okay. seven, seven, seven. Album and I've got the third MV. I have um, Disharmonium, the new one. I have Blushnogen. Um, I've ordered the one that's before that because I don't even have that one. So, you got most of them. You got most of them. Really long in, in this era. Yeah, you, know. you got most of them though, man. I mean, you, you're you're better than halfway there, and I think that's about what I have. Um, um I, I'm gonna let you guys go. Um, and uh, thank you so much. For doing this um Thank it was you. a lot of fun sweet man joining me on my as i get used to these uh streaming events so this is um, your this is your inaugural your inaugural Frank, deep, deep dive really What's you know I, inaugural I did, deep dive yeah i threw brian into the fire and uh <laughs> and uh, he, he survived so i'm getting better at this and um but i, I do just really want to say like you know it was you know, for Jeff, for you to reach out and want to include me and Peter for following up on it, you know, and, and making this happen. Um, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I, I just want to thank you for coming on and, and, and talking Blue Dove Snore. Um,